New York City. I'm Brad Smith alongside Shauna Smith. This is Yahoo Finance's flagship show, The Morning Brief. Stock features, they were holding on to gains, but off earlier highs on the heels of some fresh econ data out this morning. Now the move higher in the broader markets coming despite losses in the chip sector. You got the Philly Semiconductor Index now down about 10% from recent highs. And a fresh read on the labor market. It's Thursday, so it's initial jobless claims day. That's the number of Americans applying for unemployment benefits, and it came in unchanged at 212,000, showing signs that the labor market remains resilient. So let's get to it with the three things that you need to know. Your roadmap for the trading day. Yahoo Finance's Jen Schomberger, Madison Mills, and Alexandra Canal have more. Futures pointing to gains this morning, even as investors are scaling back expectations for rate cuts, pricing in the first cut in September with dwindling odds for a second cut this year. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester became the latest Fed official to dial back the timing of rate cut expectations, saying inflation is running higher than expected this year and that at some point the Fed will need to start cutting rates, but that the central bank doesn't need to be in a hurry to do that. We're also watching shares of Taiwan Semiconductor this morning. The chipmaker beating Q1 revenue expectations, seeing a jump in profit that was driven by high demand for its advanced chips and also their AI applications. Having said that, Taiwan Semi also revising industry growth expectations lower, excluding their memory chips. Shares of TSMC ultimately falling this morning down about 3% as part of a broader chip sell-off. And Netflix reports first quarter earnings after the bell on Thursday. Netflix results will be a big test for streaming giants with all eyes on subscriber growth. Investors are eager to see whether Netflix's crackdown on password sharing is still benefiting the stock. Today's top story, stock futures rising as investors come to terms with the reality that rates could remain higher for longer as inflation remains sticky. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester saying on Wednesday that they will cut at some point, but that there's no hurry. Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan spoke to Yahoo Finance's executive editor Brian Sazi on Wednesday and gave his thoughts on the Fed's battle with inflation. Hear ye this. They've got to win the war on inflation, and they are winning, and it's coming down, and they've got it on the right trend. And that's the great debate. Are they going to hold rates a little higher to make sure they've got it on the right trend? And so it's always been sticky. The the past would tell you it would take a longer period of time, especially when they started late, and they admit that. And therefore, it took a little longer to ring out the system. And so we've talked time and time again around where some of the probability has slipped for now consecutive meetings. And I think even increasingly among economists, they're looking for some of the rate cuts, if they do begin, to begin at the very end, perhaps Q4 of this year at this juncture. And just looking at some of the CME FedWatch tool, we had seen that shift, especially within that June meeting, jump on the back of last week's inflation data that had started to come through to no cuts. And now kind of continuing to signal that it's going to stabilize at a no cut type of scenario, even until we get into September, perhaps. September is now at a 45, 46% probability of a cut. Um, And again, that is something that we thought we were going to see in June here. And it depends upon the pacing, as you bring up all the time, too, Shauna. Yeah, certainly. I think pacing is really uh, the key to this here, just in terms of the degree of the cuts that we are essentially going to see. And once the Fed does start begin cutting, exactly what that pace looks like thereafter. I think that's a key question here for the markets. But but I also want to bring up some of the hawkish commentary that we got from Fed Vice Chair Philip Jefferson. Uh, he was out basically saying that he was making the case that the Fed should be in no rush right now to cut rates. And he said that he I am fully committed to getting inflation back to that 2% target. But, but if incoming data suggests that inflation is more persistent than it currently expected to be, it will be appropriate to hold in place the current restrictive stance of policy for longer. So I think that points back to really what we're seeing now priced into the market. You mentioned the fact that more and more investors, more and more traders are now expecting a delay here in terms of that first rate cut and the delay compared to what we had been pricing in or what the market had been pricing in uh, just about a week, a week and a half ago. When it comes to where we stand this morning, Fed Fund Futures are now pricing in only 40 basis points of rate cuts by the end of the year. And Deutsche Bank pointing out that this is the lowest that this has been so far 
in this cycle. So I think that really illustrates where we are in this cycle, where Wall Street stands right now on rate cuts. And I know Josh has a closer look at maybe some of the revised outlook that we're getting from the bigger banks. Too. Yeah. I mean, we were talking about by the time we're ready to pull the sandals back out for the summer, that we would finally see some of these cuts start to come through. It sounds like, based on some of the CME FedWatch probability, we will be going into sweater season and putting the sandals away. Josh, thanks so much for joining us here. You've got some more this morning. Bank of America, the latest big bank to push back its rate cut forecast further. Let's go out to Josh, standing by at the uh, Wi-Fi Jumbotron. We're just going to continue calling it that. <laughs> well, Brad, I'm out here at the Jumbotron, and I'm thinking about last week when I told you guys we might be able to take the summer off and come back and talk about Fed rate cuts maybe after the summer, because that's sort of, as you guys were just weighing out, really where market consensus is right now. A lot of banks, as you can see behind me, moving to September or potentially even later. You just mentioned Bank of America. They pushed their call out to December, so that would mean one rate cut this year. You can see Goldman Sachs sits at July. Goldman had at one point expected six cuts, uh, and that's a start in March, but they're now seeing July. Really, the difference in the stories you're seeing behind me is sort of different projections on how the economy is going to grow. So Goldman sees pretty strong growth for the economy. They also see the inflation story remaining intact as the year goes on. That's why they see car cuts starting in July. Bank of America sees a little bit of a bumpier path for inflation. Them and Deutsche Bank both see cuts coming in December. And Deutsche Bank also noted that the uh, election is going to matter as we get closer to that in November. It's very unlikely you would see the Fed cut right before the election, right around the election in September, in November. That's going to start to matter. And then you take a look at Citi's call. Citi's still looking for five cuts this year. Well, if you're going to have five cuts this year, the Fed probably needs to start cutting relatively soon. So that sort of gets us to that June base case. They see inflation falling enough for the Fed to cut, but a large part of Citi's call is they still see economic growth slowing. They think the Fed would cut because economic growth is slowing and the Fed is trying to prevent the economy from sinking into a deep recession. So we're still in sort of the soft landing, hard landing, no landing camps here, and then how banks are projecting cuts sort of depends on where they sit within that thesis. All right, Josh, thanks so much for breaking that down for us. And like we have been talking about, we've been getting more commentary from Fed officials in recent days regarding the timing of that first rate cut. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester expecting rate cuts at some point this year, but couching the timing just a bit, saying, quote, we will start to normalize policy back to a less restrictive stance, but we don't have to do that in a hurry. So let's talk about what we could expect going forward for that. We want to bring in Dave Mazza joining us here at the desk, Round Hill Chief Executive Officer Dave, it's great to have you here. So where do you stand? We've been talking all morning about where everyone else stands on rate cuts. What, what's your base case and how important do you think it is to the market's momentum? Yeah, and the second part of your question is really interesting here. So we saw the Powell pivot last year has become the Powell divot mm -hmm. because we cannot get out of this scrooge of inflation, particularly when we think about sticky prices versus flexible prices. And so the Cleveland Fed has great measures where they categorize inflation categories into those areas to say, hey, what actually historically has a lot of volatility and what doesn't? The problem is the sticky prices aren't supposed to be this high. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the a very difficult job for the Fed. When we think about going forward, obviously June is well off the table. July, maybe, but I think that's unlikely. And it's been pushed out. The challenge is we know the Federal Reserve doesn't want to be seen as influencing the election. Mm -hmm. And that's coming uh, in November. So maybe we could get that September cut. But at the end of the day, it's all going to depend on where inflation lands. Mm -hmm. And right now, that picture does not look very positive. And so with that in mind, I mean, a lot of people are trying to figure out what that means for their portfolio strategy now if you're pushing out the pacing of those cuts. And, and even looking into, we had a guest already say we might not even see it until late 2025. So what does that mean for the portfolio strategy in the, in the interim here? So our base case is that we do actually get some cuts this year, okay. uh, pr probably one in September. That's an interesting argument to be made because if uh, about that 2025, because if inflation does stay high, it's going to be hard for them to do that. However, it is clear that only recently has the market picked up on the fact that, that uh, the equity market, I should say, picked up that rate cuts may not happen. But what's interesting this time around is that unlike the hope for cuts that we saw during the COVID period, the economy is actually much stronger. Mm -hmm. And that's also confounding to investors and really actually confusing for economists because everyone was expecting that we would see a material slowdown, particularly in jobs growth. It hasn't happened yet. So now there's not necessarily a reason mm -hmm. for the Federal Reserve to move as soon as, the, as many had expected. 
So, Dave, then when it comes to the market's momentum, the pressure is really on earnings, right, to live up to expectations given where valuations are. Yes, we have fallen in the last couple of days, but overall, sentiment clearly, we're not too far from those all-time highs. Do you expect earnings to live up to those expectations? And then further than that, if we do see any sort of disappointment, particularly from the MAG7, how worrisome is that going to be? Yeah, it's really interesting. So markets are, uh, you know, s and is off 4% of its all-time high, you know, but people are, are freaking out for, yeah. for good reason because it's been really a steady path forward in 2023 and unexpectedly in 2024. But this earnings season, it's cliche to say that every earnings season is important. This is the show me the money earnings season because valuations have increased so much across the market. And if earnings don't don't come uh, to the extent that people are looking for, particularly from the Magnificent Seven, which has lifted earnings for the broader market, it's difficult to see actually the ability for markets to continue to go higher. But if they beat, uh, and particularly out of these big companies, Netflix, not a Magnificent Seven name, but certainly going to be important at least for sentiment, particularly with Tesla reporting next week, mm -hmm. then I actually think we can see markets regain their footing even, uh, and actually propel higher, even with some of the negative macro headlines. You know, we love a good Jerry Maguire reference to start off the day here, so I appreciate <laughs> that from you, uh, Dave. When we talk about this earnings season and the tenor we're expecting to hear from many of these CEOs, it also comes back to a demand story and, and where they're seeing resiliency among their consumer, and that consumer can be larger businesses on the kind of B2B side, or it could be B2C on the business to consumer side. What are you expecting to hear on demand specifically? Yeah, it's interesting. So we started to hear some uh, whispers of of, of uh, negativity from the consumer uh, that came in the last earnings season didn't necessarily impact the broader market. But looking right now, particularly at the Magnificent Seven, they've been an opportunity for offense for investors because of their AI exposure and defense because of their strong balance sheet and resilient, resilient earnings. But really what I'm going to be looking for across the market, not just with, with the Magnificent Seven names, is what impact is inflation having on demand, to your point, and particularly profit margins? Because they have been exceptionally strong for those mega, mega cap tech names, but particularly less so for other areas of the market. And if we, if we actually see pressure there and, and deceleration of margins, that actually actually uh, is likely going to be a bigger negative. Dave, what do you think is the biggest uh, worrisome challenge, potential headwind here for the markets? Because we talk about so much that outside of everything that's happening with the Fed. But, but, but when it comes to the fundamentals of the market, we talk about that there's still a lot to be excited about. Are there any areas of weakness or something that you have your eye on that maybe the broader investment community isn't really talking about yet? Well, I continue to be concerned about small caps and mm -hmm. non-profitable companies, right? A lot of folks expected that there would be a rotation. And that's very logical, especially when you're expecting rate cuts. But we haven't seen that. And so non-profitable companies, the Goldman Sachs index of non-profitable companies is down 23% year to date. And these are companies that are, continue, that are going to continue to struggle in a higher interest rate environment because their funding costs are much higher uh, than many, many would anticipate it. Mm -hmm. And so if we continue to see the divergence where mega cap continues to lead because of strong earnings and smaller cap, more cyclical names do poor, then I actually think we can get in an environment where we do truly get ahead of ourselves and we don't necessarily see a breather. So I'm actually keeping stocks on a much shorter leash mm -hmm. um, than I had before um, because of these headwinds, even though I'm generally still positive. Dave, great to start off and kick off, tee up the trading session, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we are still about 17 minutes out from the start of today's trade. Dave Mazza, who is the Round Hill Chief Executive Officer, joining us here. Dave, great to see you. Thank you. Absolutely. Switching gears here at Taiwan, semiconductor shares are in the red. The world's largest chip maker forecasting sales to rise as much as 30 percent in its second quarter. This is sending chip stocks higher than tumbling in a wider sell-off. To break down what this means for the wider chip market, Yahoo Finance reporter Madison Mills is here with us. Hey, Maddie. Hey, Brad. So if you look at TSMC shares this morning, obviously in the red, but if you look at the details of this print, there's really not a lot for folks to be mad about. I just want to go through some of the big beats, again, beating across every single major metric when it comes to this print here. The biggest profit growth in a year for TSMC, thanks to the AI boom. This is our number one trending ticker, by the way, on the Yahoo Finance platform this morning because of that profit growth for TSMC. Now, the reason we want to look at this name beyond the earnings cycle is 
for two reasons. One, the indication that this has on the broader chip space, and also because this could be a leading indicator heading into Apple's earnings. So starting off on the overall chip sector, as you mentioned, Brad, we are starting to see signs of potential weakness for the most expansive and the most kind of powerful chips that are available. We got a signal of that in ASML's earnings print even earlier in the day here, and we saw that in the details of TSMC as well for their 3MN offering. The lower the number is at the top of what I just said, the more powerful the chip is. And we saw a decline in demand for that. That could be a sign that what analysts have been saying, that chips uh, continue to kind of be a one-time purchase, could continue to be an issue. Really important to note on Apple, though, sales contributions from smartphones declining 16% in the first quarter. That could point to headwinds in the overall iPhone business. That could be a bad sign for Apple coming into their earnings here, but it could also be part of seasonality. Those iPhone sales do tend to pick up in autumn, so we'll have to see. But Apple, reminder, is down 10% year to date here. All right, Maddie, thanks so much. We want to get to Netflix because a huge report that is going to happen after the bell here this afternoon. Their first quarter earnings are on dock. We're looking at a move of down about four tenths of a percent here ahead of the open, but investors are going to be closely watching a number of the key metrics out from Netflix here. Subscriber editions is one of those key metrics. Ali Canal is here with a closer look of what to expect. And Ali, when it comes to uh, these results that we're going to be getting from Netflix, what is the key thing that investors or Wall Street is going to be closely watching? It's going to be watching how those revenue initiatives, like the password sharing crackdown, the ad tier, how that continues to play out for some of these net metrics. You mentioned subscribers. That is expected to slow sequentially after the company reported 13 million subs in the fourth quarter. Uh, Wall Street expecting subscribers of closer to 5 million, although that number could come in above estimates. In terms of revenue, earnings per share, revenue expected to come in at just under $9.3 billion, while earnings per share at $4 and about 52 cents there. Now, like I said, there's a number of revenue initiatives that Netflix has rolled out, password sharing crackdown being one of them. A lot of analysts on Wall Street believe there's still more room to run here as some accounts are just starting to be hit, and that could be a boon to subscribers. But the stock is currently trading near the high end of its 52-week highs. It's had a run up over the past several months. So this is going to be a high bar for Netflix to cross. And a lot of analyst notes out there, although bullish, are saying that could potentially be a risk to earnings. Because when you have such a high valuation, the bar is that much higher when you think about what investors are ultimately looking for. So that could potentially be a risk to the stock price, depending on what we see today. But Netflix continues to remain the number one streaming platform. We've heard even from major media companies like Disney, they are looking to Netflix as really the guiding light here when it comes to how to navigate this very complicated streaming landscape. Right, and the activists want the margins exactly. to look more like Netflix, at least mm -hmm. the Disney activists yeah. do at this juncture. All yeah. right, Allie, you've got a busy day ahead of you. Yes, We're going to let you uh, prepare for what's, what's ahead. All right, Allie, thanks so much. Thank you. Well, coming up next here on Yahoo Finance, more bad news for Tesla, the EV maker getting another downgrade, this time from Deutsche Bank. We've got the top trending dickers for you next.
Hey, let's take a look at some trending tickers this morning. We've got just inside of 10 minutes until the start of trade. Let's zero in on Tesla. Ticker symbol TSLA, more bad news for the company. Shares falling again today after Deutsche Bank's Emmanuel Rosner downgrading the stock from hold to buy, slashing his price target to $123. That's from $189. Rosner says that with no new vehicle, Tesla will face more headwinds to growth. So that's the setup. We were talking about the fireworks that this company is seeing going into earnings. And one of the ways that they perhaps, perhaps could quell some concerns that persist in the market right now, especially with the waning EV demand, is with a new vehicle announcement. Uh, they have to uncloak it. They got to pull that, that Casper sheet off of one of those models, the silhouettes that we've seen even since this time last year. Yeah, exactly. And I think this really hinges on the fact that a cheaper EV is so critical to the market. We've been talking to a number of analysts, for, uh, a Tesla analysts about this specifically, also just a number of industry experts saying that really what is needed in order to uh, have wider adoption of EVs is more cheaper options. Clearly, when you look at the price tag, especially in this type of environment, higher interest rates, it's tougher and tougher for consumers really to afford higher priced cars, many of those being EVs. EV. So the fact that Tesla potentially will not be able or will not produce that model, that model two, which is going to be their mass market uh, vehicle here, that could be a real headwind, and it's exactly what Deutsche Bank is pointing out within this. No, it's saying that Tesla bringing out a twenty-five thousand and twenty-five thousand dollar next gen vehicle late next year. If they don't do that, that is no longer going to support some of the volumes that they're expecting. Margins, free cash flow, so really puts a lot of that into question there, and a big reason why we're seeing such a uh, leg like lower here for the stock, not only today, obviously, on the heels of this downgrade, but clearly what we have seen since the start of the year with Tesla, one of the worst performers, if not the worst performer, in the S&P 500. And especially when you think about the pricing for some of the electric vehicle models, and I was discussing this with Rick and Pross yesterday, who just completed their most recent ride along. It was a for a Kia, not a Tesla. It's going to come back to utilization. How often do people, do households, consider themselves utilizing the Tesla and the network that they would have to tap into in order to charge, especially Especially with the range considerations at the price level right now that EVs have to go up against with the standard combustion engine vehicles. And so all of that considered, uh, and everybody should go check out their ride-alongs that they do. I can't wait for them to do one in a Tesla as well. I imagine that they just begin the video like they're back-to-back, -back, like they're on the cover of Lethal Weapon. All that considered, I think that... Offering some production tips here as well. Exactly. You know, one of the huge things as well, the, the buy rating that they had here within this report just to bring it full circle, really predicated on that next-gen vehicle. $25,000, though, is the price tag that mm -hmm. it would need to come in at. Yeah. So it's a question of whether or not that $25 is before or after some of the federal subsidies as well. That's a good point. And I mentioned Tesla being one of the worst. It's actually the worst performer in the S&P 500 since the start of the year. It shares off 37 percent. All right, let's take a look at the housing sector. And with that, DR Horton, it's a trending ticker on Yahoo Finance today. Earnings blowing past expectations for the second quarter, raising its full year revenue forecast as a slowdown in housing supply boosted sales for the home builder. You're looking at gains of just about 5 percent. Brad, you and I have talked about this time and time again, just the fact that New home sales or new, uh, uh, home builders is almost the only game in town for those who are still out there trying to buy a home, given the fact that existing homes people are not moving. We talk time and time again about the lock-in effect driven by higher age, driven by the fact that we've seen a massive move to the upside in home prices. So people who own homes are not selling their homes. Those that want to buy don't have the inventory that we have historically seen in terms of selection. So the pressure is really on home builders trying to keep up with that demand. I think that's really the critical question here for analysts about what exactly that is going to look like here and the ability of these home builders to try everything they can to keep up with demand, especially in the face of this higher interest rate environment. Yeah, whenever I see some of these earnings reports, and we've talked about this in the past too, I always do a command F or a control F if you're on a Microsoft system for backlog. And the company's sales order backlog of homes under contract decreased 7% to 17,873 homes and 5% in value to $7 billion. You compare that to what that was last year, the same quarter last year, $7.4 billion. So what does that tell you about the health of the broader home buying market? Well, that tells you that there are not, to your point, as many people that are willing or gung-ho to enter into the market unless they see some type of pricing mechanism 
be more favorable for them, where the uh, seller of these homes or the builder of these homes, especially the new ones, is more malleable on where they're able to counteract some of the mortgage prices with the price of the actual home as well and that they're selling for. And so that is something that I think DR Horton, Toll Brothers, Lennar, we're going to continue to hear from all of them and how they're uh, enacting some of that pricing mechanism too. Certainly. All right, let's take a look at Alaska Air because it's reporting a narrower loss than expected for the first quarter, also raising its full year profit forecast as it looks to bounce back following an incident back in January where a fuselage panel blew off one of its planes shortly after takeoff leading to the temporary grounding of Boeing 737 MAX 9 and really the first to the latest uh, what has been a number of issues here for Boeing over the last several months. But when it comes to Alaska Air, at least a move that we're seeing to the upside here in shares, a bit of a relief here for investors in terms of some of the reaction that we're seeing from the street here, early reaction to these results. Uh, Cities, uh, Stephen Trent, friend of the show, he's on with us not too long ago, saying that Alaska Air is well positioned post pandemic thanks to strong revenue diversification, including premium cabin offerings and a robust co branded car remuneration. So, really just pointing to the fact that even though there are some concerns, at least in the immediate or really short term here, he thinks they, they remain well positioned here for the longer term to really capture some of that growth that's, that's continued and expected here in the coming quarters. Yeah, they kind of within this report had to provide a grounding impact yeah. assessment as well as excluding grounding impact. And I think that's exactly the story here for Alaska Airlines right now, a company that is so heavily impacted by what took place with that fuselage and uh, the door plug blowing out and in the mindset of consumers for many of the people, especially within an environment where year over year we're already seeing a rise in the number of travelers compared to 2023, where Alaska Airlines is going to have to really um, really work hard in order to retain or bring back a lot of those potential passengers too. So in the area, we'll stick with us here on Yahoo Finance. We are just two minutes away from the opening bell. We've got that for you on the other side. We'll be right back. All right, bing bong, that's the opening bell on Wall Street, spoken by yours truly. Sky, or ski however you're pronouncing it at home, Sky <laughs> Therapeutics. Ski-yay. Yeah, I know, a biosciences company out there. They're ringing the opening bell at the NASDAQ, and Ibotta, ticker symbol IBTA. 
ringing the opening bell at the New York Stock Exchange. Let's take a look at how the markets are moving to begin today's activity. Looks like we have some green across the board for the major averages to start off today's trading session. We do. We're holding on to gains here, Brad, at the open. You've got the Dow up just around 130. You've got the S&P also pushing to the upside, up just about two-tenths of a percent there. So still above that 5,000 mark. And then when you take a look at the NASDAQ, we're seeing a bit of a move to the upside here, up just about a tenth of a percent. I also want to point out some of the action that we're seeing in the bond market, specifically the 10-year yield pushing to the upside up just about two basis points to 461. This was on the heels of the Philly Fed data that we got out earlier this morning. So we're seeing a bit of a move higher in the 10-year, not as much of a reaction. We can take a look at the reaction of the two-year. And then real quick, before we throw it over, we also want to take a look at the sector action as well, because when you pull that up as we get to there, we are certainly seeing a lot of green on the screen. Uh, materials, once again, the outperformer in early trading action. Yeah, technology pulling up the caboose, though, here on the day, down by about two-tenths of a percent right now. All right, we want to get over to Ali Canal. She has a closer look at some of those trending tickers here on Yahoo Finance. Ali. Hey, Shauna. Yeah, that's right. Lots of earnings today. And let's kick things off with the number one trending ticker on the Yahoo Finance homepage. That's Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, otherwise known as TSMC. The chip company reported its first year profit rise in a year, but shares are falling this morning after it issued a warning on the industry's recovery from last year's inventory glut. TSMC, which makes chips for major companies like Apple and NVIDIA, cut its forecast for overall market growth this year to 10%. That's down from more than 10% three months ago. Now, this does exclude memory chips as AI demand continues to remain strong. But the company did maintain its forecast that revenue growth will surge by more than 20% this year. So interesting to see the reaction on shares. Next up, we have DR Horton. Shares are rising at the open after the company beat earnings expectations and also raised its fiscal year revenue outlook. The home build builder did warn that inflation and mortgage rates remain elevated but net sales were still able to rise 14% year over year as the tight housing supply boosted those sales. Demographics supporting housing demand also continued to be favorable. And then finally, rounding things out with Alaska Airlines. The airliner topped Q2 and full year earnings guidance as travel demand is expected to remain strong. The company posted a narrower year over year net loss while revenue came in 2% higher compared to last year. The airliner also received 162 million dollars from Boeing following that door plane incident in January. Alaska said it expects additional compensation from Boeing. So something to watch as that company continues to undergo that federal safety review. Shauna. All right, Ali, thanks so much for that. Let's talk about some of the moves that we're seeing in the broader market because market expectations on rate cuts have moved to September for many of the banks, at least several of the big banks pushing out their previous June rate cut expectations to later on this year. One company, though, that's on your screen right now that hasn't is Citi, still expecting a June cut. So let's talk about that with Robert Sock, and he is Citi's senior global economist here to break it all down. Robert, it's great to have you here. So talk to us just about, walk us through your expectation and why you think June is still in play for the Fed to cut rates. Hello, thanks uh, so much for having me. Yeah, it's a very close call um, about when the Fed might start cutting rates. I think this is still a Fed that would like to get the easing process started at some point uh, this year. Um, but, you know, the inflation data for the first quarter has come in um, a lot stronger than expected. And at the same time, the activity data um, has come in uh, more robust uh, than expected as well. So that combination of factors, I think, is leading to exactly what you said, people to push out their calls for rate cuts as well as markets to push out as well. We still think there's going to be enough progress um, in inflation by the time you get to that June meeting, that there'll be enough evidence that the Fed is willing to start that easing cycle. Now, after that, it could be a very gradual easing cycle, depending on how inflation and the economy hold up. But on balance, we're holding to that because I think there's going to be enough evidence that they could get that started. But as I said, of course, the risks are shifting um, to a later start and to a slower grind down of the policy rate. Is that because we were stuck on transitory for so long, or, or is there something else that is now at play, Robert? I think it's uh, with, you know, the inflation element, um, you know, we're still seeing very sticky uh, services inflation um, that looked like it was coming down pretty significantly 
as goods inflation was also falling, but it's kind of stalled out, not just in the US, but also but also globally, we're still seeing in a lot of economies kind of extensive services pressure. So I do think um, that you're seeing central bankers in general being cautious uh, because they're worried that that services side of the inflation uh, might be longer lived than they had originally thought. And as I said, at the same time, if you look at the US, the economy is particularly resilient um, so, you know, the Fed may be in no rush to cut if it's worried about inflation being stickier for longer. Robert, if we don't see a cut in June or July, would that be a mistake? I think it, I think it again, depends uh, on the outlook. The economy has been uh, surprising us significantly to the upside. We just saw very strong um, uh, numbers come out of the IMF for what it expects the U.S. Uh, to grow. So I think if you're in an environment where the economy is growing that well, and inflation is coming down slowly, then it makes sense for the Fed to uh, potentially show some patience. Now, there are some signs that some things are softening in the US. We're seeing some labor survey data look a bit softer, um, some seeing some strains on lower income consumers. So, you know, it's going to depend on how the outlook evolves. But I think um, if the data continue the way that they are, um, I think the Fed can be patient. So it all, it'll all depend if the data in the second quarter looks like it's looked in the first quarter. Nobody likes to hear that wages might need to moderate even lower or be in decline, but is that the reality of where we'd finally see inflation really get towards that Fed target? I think that's the huge debate right now. Right now we're seeing uh, wage growth being well above pre-pandemic levels in a wide range of economies. And the question is, you know, can services inflation, which is much more labor intensive than, than good sectors, can services inflation come down with wage growth at these levels? Um, it, it's possible. You can make arguments that could be more sustainable. For example, in the U.S., we're seeing uh, much stronger productivity numbers of late. Now, it's unclear if that's a productivity surge or if it's just making up for weaker productivity earlier in the pandemic. Um, but if you are actually getting a big productivity boost, um, that would mean that those higher level of uh, wage growth that we're seeing could be sustainable. So there's a lot of factors. So it's not, it doesn't necessarily mean that if wage growth runs at these levels, that services inflation can't come down, but you need other things to be happening in the background to make those level of uh, the wage growth uh, sustainable. Robert, are you, st are you confident that we are going to see a, a soft landing scenario? Because we've been talking more and more just about how a no landing scenario obviously getting a bit more play. How confident are you that soft landing is still likely and in the cards? Yeah, I think um, certainly if you look at the back half of last year, the data were really feeling quite soft landing ish. You were having on that six month period inflation running pretty close to target. Um, and you were uh, seeing growth uh, remain quite resilient. Now, as I said, with that stronger inflation data to start the year and resilient activity, you do raise the risk that it could be a longer drip down for inflation to come back to target. But I would still say, you know, that the data are kind of feeling soft landing-ish uh, in this in this environment, uh, given the still strength that we're seeing on the consumer side and the fact that inflation has improved in a lot of dimensions. It's still obviously too high, but it's much better than it was uh, earlier in this cycle. And it might just be that it's going to take longer for it to come down. And that's where the Fed might be thinking that they can be more patient bringing down rates. But I think uh, certainly over the Q1 period, um, that soft landing probability has risen quite a, quite a bit in the U.S. Yeah, New York Fed President John Williams speaking today, and we were flashing across the bottom of the screen just a pull quote of what he had said done, and not seeing urgency to cut rates right now, to your point, Robert. Thanks so much. we got a host of Fed speak coming out later on today as well. Robert Sockin, City Senior Global Economist, joining us here today. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, Bitcoin and the next halving. That could be coming in the upcoming days. So what does it mean for the future of the crypto coin? That's next.
The price of Bitcoin has no shortage of catalysts from the debate around regulation to whether it's a security or a commodity and whether or not it really is digital gold. But one event is undeniable in its impact on the world's most premier digital asset, the halving. Every four years, the reward for mining the biggest cryptocurrency is cut in half. This happens in order to reduce the amount of coins in circulation. How is it calculated? Well, it happens specifically every time 210,000 blocks are mined. We can calculate the date fairly precisely with the knowledge that the average block time for Bitcoin mining is around 10 minutes. That calculation gets us very close to four years. Why is it needed? Because there's only so much Bitcoin available, 21 million to be exact. And like any other cryptocurrency, it needs to remain scarce to hold its value. So how often does this happen? Well, the halving takes place every four years. The first in 2012 decreased the award for creating a new block from 50 to 25 Bitcoin. The second halving in 2016, that lowered the reward further from 25 Bitcoin to 12 and a half Bitcoin. Last time out, 2020. And you guessed it, we halved again. The block award dropping to 6.25 Bitcoin. So, there's nothing wrong with your math here. This time around, the block reward miners will receive half, 3.125 Bitcoin. The big question, of course, what happens to the price? Now, the moves could be significant. In the past, we've seen Bitcoin rise after a halving event, though there's no certainty that this will always be the outcome. The other key focus is the outcome for the miners. The rewards that they're generating will, of course, diminish, and that's not great for an industry with a very high cost burden. Keep an eye on how the big publicly listed miners, the likes of Marathon and Riot, manage this event. As ever, talks of consolidation will no doubt do the rounds. No matter how you look at it, the event will have serious consequences for all crypto stakeholders and will be across all of the developments here at Yahoo Finance. With Bitcoin's next halving expected in the coming days, many investors are wondering if they will see a similar windfall to the ones that they saw in previous halvings, where Bitcoin's price skyrocketed over the following months. But is this time, is it going to be different? Let's ask Dan Dolev. He is Mizuho Securities Managing Director. Dan, it's great to see you. So talk to us just about what you think, at least starting with the halving, before we get to your thoughts more broadly about Bitcoin, but starting with the halving, what kind of impact do you see that having on the price of Bitcoin? Hi, thanks for having me. I, look, I think this time is, I think actually this time is different, right? Interest rates are higher. Um, it's sort of, you know, third, third time's a charm. Uh, people kind of know it's happening much more than they did in the prior, you know, prior cycles. And I think all the upside that you saw heading into the last few weeks pre the downturn uh, show you that we're kind of already pricing it, fully pricing it in. So I actually expect more downside than upside at this point. Okay, and downside at this juncture, I mean, where else do you think that this could actually transpire and have a broader ripple effect across crypto as well? Because if there is more downside in this event here, then that is going to take some of the enthusiasm out of the rest of the crypto landscape. 100%. So, you know, my concern is mostly with uh, Coinbase, where I have a, an underperform. And if you think about what happened with, with Bitcoin, it actually... Um, started this whole wave of altcoins, right? That's kind of a nice way to, to call them. And and they're traded, you know, at parity or, or, you know, when Bitcoin volumes go up, then the altcoin volumes go up and, and Coinbase makes a lot of money off of the altcoins. So if Bitcoin continues to lose momentum, this is going to drag down all these altcoins. And then eventually when people start losing money, which they haven't until now, uh, they're going to be more cautious on pricing. And I expect, you know, spread contraction on the retail side to happen, and that's kind of my bearish uh, view on Coinbase. So, sort of, a, I agree with the ripple effect. Uh, it's going to be pretty bad when it unravels. Do you think that's going to be immediate, Dan? I think I think we're already in it right now. I mean, you saw, you know, the the best example is the last weekend, right? Geopolitical concerns. Bitcoin was perceived as sort of a safe uh, safe haven, and it wasn't. It actually traded down significantly on on the you know, Israel-Iran situation. So I, I, I do think that we're already in this sort of Bitcoin bear market and it's starting to happen, you know, these days. Dan, how do you see it unraveling? And, or, or how are we in the unraveling right now that you were talking about, especially if we're just coming off of some of these new all-time highs and the happening is expected to create even more all-time highs coming off of the typical valuation or the typical value moves that we've seen after previous cycles? 
because everyone knows about it now, right? Mm -hmm. Like the publicity that, you know, the halving, halving has right now is, you know, multiples of what it was in the last cycle and definitely like two cycles ago. So everyone traded or, or the Bitcoin was already fully pricing and it's kind of a sell the news event at this point. So I, I don't think that, I think that once the event actually happens, there's going to be a running for the exit. So that's what I said in this sort of third time's a charm. Uh, people are, have gotten used to it. The anticipation was so big and uh, people were dreaming the, you know, drumming the, you know, the, on, on the, on the, on the event. And now it's kind of like uh, heading the other way. So I, I, I see this like significant sell the news, um, you know, catalyst coming in the next couple of weeks. But again, my concern is mostly with Coinbase. Bitcoin is obviously a huge driver of this, so I, I kind of have to follow what's going on with Bitcoin. Yeah, and it, that is a good point to make. The, the one thing I will say to counter it is also talking about why it's a bit different this time is because we have the Bitcoin ETFs, more institutional involvement. Is that going to buoy the losses then at all to the downside or maybe the immediate risk to the downside that we are seeing at all, given the fact that it is backed by institutions and a bit more, I think investors are a bit more comfortable maybe now compared investing in Bitcoin than they were uh, just a few months ago. Exactly. I think that the swing effect here, because the the lever is just so much bigger mm -hmm. and there's so much more involvement, The if you have this sort of running you know, to the exit, there's going to be a stampede uh, in, in, in Bitcoin just because there's so much ETF and, and, and equity is kind of tied to it right now, which I think is is the embedded risk with this whole so-called asset category, which I think is silly to begin with, but you know, doesn't matter what I think. It, it totally does, Dan. I mean, we value your <laughs> insights and your perspective here. <laughs> you know, one of the huge, I think, frames of mind as well is what this is gonna mean for the miners out there. And I'm, I'm not sure if that's in your coverage universe. I know that we've talked at length about Coinbase in the past and some of the other crypto touching platforms, but the miners have been looked at by some investors as, uh, and as I was tracking them yesterday, all of them are down at least like 30, 40% over the course of this year with the anticipation of the having driving up costs for them. But does that make them potential kind of acquisition targets mm. um, by some of the larger firms? Yeah, I mean, again, I don't follow them. Yeah. Definitely not very closely. Um, I, I really don't know. I think, yeah, it, it depends if if the future for Bitcoin changes dramatically, if there is a kind of a paradigm shift over the next few weeks, then why would anyone be interested? Um, you know, you're seeing some of those predictions by some of my counterparts. I think they're invent, you know, they're invented, right? Like, I mean, give me one use case of Bitcoin. Why do you need it? You don't really need it, right? So, I mean, this is it's, you have to have a point of view on Bitcoin, right? So, I, yeah. I think, I think it's in in in. I don't know how your Yiddish is, but I think it's Bobkiss. <laughs> Dan, thanks so much for taking the time as always. Uh, really appreciate I would love to know what that chart is behind you as well. We'll, we'll oh, leave that for another conversation. Yeah. This is my Bitcoin prediction chart. Okay. There we go. We should have started with that, yeah, Dan. Know, right? we the, summed the it up pretty quickly. From, uh, the ruler is from the Rocky Horror Picture Show. <laughs> Take a step to your right. <laughs> Dan, Going down, always Mizzou. a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for Thank you. giving us some time and insights here. Dan Dolev, Mizuho Securities Managing Director. Good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, everyone, analysts at JP Morgan upgrade JetBlue. We'll tell you the biggest headwinds they see for the airline and some potential tailwinds next.
Let's go to the skies. Another stock that we're watching today, JetBlue. Shares of JBLU, they're up 2%. Well, actually, they were up 2%. Now they're up 5%. Great news for them. JP Morgan ditched its underweight rating on the stock to neutral. Now, analysts at JP Morgan are improving the 2025 earnings forecast on the airline, saying JetBlue is well positioned for a modest potential move to the upside based on improving market sentiment. And there again, we are seeing shares move higher right now off of this news by about five and a quarter percent. They said they believe JetBlue's second quarter guide coming next week may exceed that of consensus, and they're maintaining their street high. Um, particularly here, second least liked airline they mentioned, though, as well, based on some of these sell-side ratings out there. Yeah, and they also couched us with the fact that they do see better risk-reward elsewhere within the sector. But they are positive on JetBlue for a number of factors, just in terms of when you compare it to maybe some of the other uh, factors that we're seeing play out within the sector. They're saying that while JetBlue's margins, they do continue to see those trailing those of the big three. That limited his enthusiasm just a bit. But some of the factors, though, as to why he is a bit bullish, he talked about the companies at New York Real Estate and Management. He thinks that that could actually, quote, yield a more turnaround momentum than elsewhere in the beleaguered domestic space. So the price target said it's 7 bucks a share uh, that af after being previously withdrawn here, adding some of that positive sentiment that we're seeing this move higher on the stock, now trading just above that level at 717. But again, this move higher here, the fact that J.P. Morgan at least no longer saying sell JetBlue. They are now neutral. They went from underweight to neutral on the name, saying that they do think, like you said, it really goes back to what we're going to hear next week on that earnings call, on the guidance, and the fact that, hey, maybe they are going to surprise to the upside there. And it's a competitive landscape analysis, too. They expect to be underwhelmed by Southwest's yeah. pending turnaround announcement here. Uh, they also mentioned new management at JetBlue at the helm, potentially ending what they would characterize as a high tolerance for loss production under the previous CEO. All right. All right. Well, coming up here, keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Madison Mills is going to be joining me for the next hour. We will break existing home sales data for you right at 10 a.m. Eastern time. Then we're going to dive into Tesla's wild ride. Wedbush's analyst Dan Ives is going to join us on that next hour. All right. I'm going to grab a snack and come right back for wealth at 11 a.m. Eastern time. We'll break down what the latest existing home sales data means for buyers out there. Plus, Senator Cynthia Lummis joins us to discuss a new bill to protect stablecoin investors. Stay tuned, you're watching Yahoo Finance.
Welcome back to Yahoo Finance. I'm Shawna Smith alongside Madison Mills, and we're 30 minutes into the trading day. Here are three big stories that we're watching here this morning. Let's start with the stock move higher, at least for the Dow and the S&P. You're looking at gains for the Dow up just around 191 points. S&P also moving to the upside. At least for now, we're reversing the four days of decline. So this comes as earnings really take center stage, trying to take the spotlight away from the fact that the Fed could potentially d- delay its first rate cut, and that is what has really been spooking markets as of late. And spooking treasuries as well with yields on the 10-year jumping to session highs with the entire yield curve rebounding from its earlier flattening. This coming after some economic data, including the Philadelphia Fed's factory index that came in beating expectations. That could be a signal of some continued growth, which would therefore put pressure on the Fed moving forward. And Netflix earnings are on deck after the closing bell today. All eyes are going to be on the streaming giant subscriber growth as a bump from last year's password sharing crackdown is expected to slow. We are looking at losses of just about a two tenths of a percent move to the downside ahead of those results. All right, first, let's get to some breaking data that we have out on housing. We have March's existing home sales. That number just released here moments ago. It actually fell just over 4%, 4.3% to 4.19 million there. That was below what the street had been looking for March's existing home sales falling 4.3%, like I said, after rising 9.5% that prior month. Now, the forecast was a range between 4 and 4.5 million there. February was unrevised at 4.38 million, that pace there. But again, not necessarily a massive surprise given the fact that higher mortgage rates are keeping those who do own homes currently locked into the homes that they had. They are not putting them on the market. Therefore, those home sales numbers have been depressed just a bit when it comes to existing homes. And also, especially after last month's a surprising move to the upside there, where it did jump 9.5%. That, that was a number that did catch the street by surprise. So not necessarily um, shocking here that we are seeing this move to the downside, especially when you take into account the larger dynamics at play within the housing market, Maddie. That's exactly right, Sean. And I just want to pull up what we're seeing. If you take a look here, I have existing home sales up for us on the board. I'm waiting for it to kind of adjust to some of the numbers that you just laid out for us, Shauna. But I want to pull up what we're seeing across the broader stock market here, if I can, because I'm curious to see what we're seeing across the board. There we go. So we're looking at, I lost it for a second here, but we were looking across some of the major indices. I'm going to take a look. It looks like the Dow and the S&P 500 are in the green here. It looks like the NASDAQ is slipping into the red. That is probably because of the sell-off that we're seeing in the broader tech market. That could be an indication to me that the market not seeing a huge reaction, at least when it comes to these existing home sales. It was relatively priced in, but still a little bit of a surprise. I think what's dragging the NASDAQ still moving forward here down about three-tenths of a percent is probably that broader sell-off that we're seeing in the tech space this morning. All right, Maddie, thanks so much. Let's bring in uh, Logan uh, uh, Modashami. He is Housing Wire's lead economist here, lead analyst, excuse me, to break down the latest on what we're seeing from these existing housing number. And Logan, when you take a look at the fact that we did drop 4.3% here in this latest reading that comes after that 9.5% jump that we saw back in February, what does that tell us just about the dynamics at play right now in the housing market and the fact that these low inventory levels are likely going to be a factor, a real challenge here for the market going forward? Well, to me, it's more about Mortgage rates, we have a similar marketplace as we did last year when mortgage rates fell toward the end of 2022 and early 2023. We saw a boost in demand and then rates started to go up and sales fell for the rest of the year. So we're seeing similar action this year so far as rates have picked up. But I would say one thing different about this year than last year is that we actually do have a little bit more sellers. Uh, New listings data, while it's not spectacular, has been growing year over year. So there is a potential to have more sales this year if mortgage rates fall. So to me, it's more about a mortgage rate story than the uh, low active listings. What is going to push down those mortgage rates then, particularly if we do see that we continue to be in a higher for longer environment? Uh, I haven't been a Fed pivot person since 2022, and uh, until jobless claims start to rise noticeably and the Fed feels the pressure of their dual mandate, uh, we can stay elevated. Uh, for a longer period. So uh, where jobless claims goes, you know, uh, th- that would be the, you know, material impact to where mortgage rates would fall toward. And so far today, jobless claims are still very historically low. Logan, when it comes, just taking a step back here, how unusual is this dynamic right now that's playing out within the housing market? Well, 
we're at record all-time lows in inventory, and we have unbelievably strong homeowner uh, balance sheets. So you have to ask yourself, what actually pushes the housing market to get an accelerated inventory? And to me, that would actually probably be a job loss recession at that point. Uh, a lot of almost everybody has a 30 year fixed mortgage that's uh, doing very well on their uh, monthly payments. And also over 40 percent of homes in America don't have a mortgage. So we can stay in this very low level of sales until mortgage rates get down towards six percent and stay there. That's the key. Uh, we've seen demand grow when rates fall. We just never been able to keep rates low enough, long enough. And I'm not talking about three or four or five percent, but getting down to six percent, you could hold these sales gains. And what we're seeing right now is what we saw last year. Uh, rates went down, sales boosted up for one or two months, and now sales are slowly tricking lower. And that should be the case as long as mortgage rates keep on heading higher. So then Logan, what does that then tell us about pricing? Now, pricing, of course, is the thing that shocked everybody, but keep it simple. Uh, we are near record lows in inventory and home sales aren't crashing anymore. 2022 was very abnormal. We had the biggest home sale crash ever recorded in history. And then that kind of stopped after November of 2022. So it's basically an equilibrium fight right now. The higher rates go, the weakness in pricing can continue. If rates fall back down with inventory this low, pricing gets better. So it's a tug of war between rates and inventory. But unlike last year, inventory is is growing year over year on the active side and new listing side. So that will put pricing pressure, especially in areas 19 levels. And as long as demand stays weak, price growth should cool down noticeably as the year goes on. But again, if rates fall, then that variable changes. Well, there's been this, this points to this broader question of whether or not higher interest rates are low key inflationary because they're keeping people locked in to their houses who have lower mortgage rates. And that lack of home buying is giving people more capital to spend elsewhere who aren't locked in to paying a monthly payment for their mortgages. How are you seeing that dynamic play out and what would potentially change that dynamic? You know, to me, it's when we think about inflation, whether CPI or, or, or PC inflation, it's really rents. And one of the detrimental things about higher rates right now is that permits for building apartments are at great recession lows or heading toward the great recession lows. We're at the COVID-19 lows. So the housing market, two thirds of it is already in a recession. Single family permits are holding up well, but if you keep rates high enough, long enough, the future production of homes will be a problem. So we're getting a lot of apartments that are coming onto the marketplace. We have a lot of homes under construction. That's beneficial to fight inflation. But two years down the line, we're just we just can't revamp things fast enough. So for now, we're going to get more supply on the rental side, which really impacts CPI inflation. But after that, uh, I'm not looking for any kind of apartment boom anymore. That that sector is already busted. All right, Logan Motoshami, Housing Wire Lead Analyst. Really appreciate you joining us this morning on all things home sales. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Well, as rate cut bets shift, so have moves in one sector in particular. We're talking chips. Shares of AMD and Intel both down over 15% in the last month. NVIDIA falling 10% from its all-time high in March. The Philadelphia Semiconductor Index also dropping over 10% from record highs, uh, entering what we would call correction territory today, meaning just over a 10% decline. And Shauna, it's really interesting given what we were talking about earlier with the TSMC earnings because they were such a a huge beat across the board, huge profits, record-breaking profits, seeing that continued AI demand, and yet that name is also down in the pre-market this morning. So perhaps we're seeing this indication that the analysts that have been saying that, you know, chips can sometimes be a one-time purchase, there's a little bit of concern about whether or not there's going to be long-term demand for the amount of supply out there. Yeah, I think when it comes to TSMC, at least what we heard from them this morning, yes, it was very strong for that company, especially given the fact that the role that they play with Apple, with NVIDIA, clearly very, very well positioned, even with AMD, within the, within the chip space. But then when you take a look at their commentary, and it seemed to be at least a little bit less upbeat about the overall market yeah. and where things stand. And I think that really speaks to that move lower that we have been seeing in a number of those chip stocks, specifically that move lower that we have been talking about this morning in the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, really over the last several days. When you talk about a drop falling more than 10% from that recent peak, really just points to some of that weakness within this space. So when you look past some of those larger players that are holding up well and do have that pricing power within this current environment, you are still seeing a number of names and a number of the smaller names continue to struggle just a bit on that pricing front. They're also dealing with the demand in 
impact, what exactly that is going to look like. And also, there certainly is a lot of uncertainty, at least in the immediate term and the short term, over the next several quarters. So I think that really has been weighing on uh, the broader index itself. So outside some of those larger player names, we have been seeing weakness underneath the surface. And I think that really points to that downward move that we've been seeing in the index. And that's such a great point that the CEO did say on the call that they are concerned about the overall semiconductor market in general moving forward. And they talked a lot about kind of the decline in iPhone sales mm -hmm. being part of that. But I also have to wonder whether or not an NVIDIA would come in and take any chips they can get. And that might be the thing that can boost this market. Moving yeah, forward. exactly. And I think that's why there's a lot of unknowns. And there's still many out there on the street who are extremely bullish on a number of chip names. And that's exactly why, given the outsized demand that we're seeing right now for AI, the technology, and obviously so much of that CapEx investment that is still de being deployed right now is going towards technology, is going towards AI. And we have seen that demand reflected in many of these results as yeah. of late. Yeah. All right, we'll keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Coming up, we have been talking about the rate cut debate all morning. Well, our next guest says that if the Fed cuts this year, it could be a mistake. We'll explain why next. Seen a mixed picture from stocks this morning, but we are starting to see them trading to the upside here despite investors pushing back their rate cut expectations, pricing in that first cut in September with dwindling odds of a second rate cut coming this year. While most investors are eagerly awaiting that first rate cut to take place, our next guest is not.
For more on this, we are joined by Eddie Gabor, Key Advisors, Wealth Management Co-Founder and Co-CEO. And Eddie, thank you so much for joining us. I want to start with your base case here. What are you anticipating? So I do think the Fed will ultimately cut rates one time by September. Uh, I don't think they'll do it in June, maybe July. Uh, but as you stated earlier, I think a rate cut, uh, although it'll be perceived as bullish initially, and you'll see the markets more than likely rip on that news, uh, I think that's the biggest mistake they can make. Uh, it'll be a repeat of what we saw in the late 70s, because the big problem that we're dealing with right now is inflation. And the bond market is telling us right now that there is a problem, meaning that we are not close to where they're trying to get to that 2% number. So if they cut rates, that's actually inflationary. It's counterintuitive to what they're trying to do. So if they cut rates, our biggest concern is we will see a major reacceleration of inflation in the latter part of this year. When you just look at the base effects and compare it to oil on a year-over-year -year basis, plus the inflation the cuts would cause, now you're looking at 2025, a cycle where they may have to come in and kill the economy and the markets by raising rates. The bottom line is right now, the economy doesn't need stimulus. Uh, all the data supports that. So I think the markets are just having a correction right now to reassess the interest rate environment, but the markets can hold up just fine with no rate cuts. Uh, so again, if they do make cuts, it'll look good early on, uh, but I think it's gonna be a major problem in headwind uh, heading into next year because they'll be having to raise rates, which that's the last thing they want to do. Would they even have to be talking about raising rates before the end of this year? It's a contrarian view, Eddie, but, but when you talk about the fact that there's lots to be concerned about when you look at the inflationary trends, when you look at the fact that the labor market remains so resilient at this point, I, should that be something that should be more within the discussion? I think it's on the table, but if you look at what the bond market has done in regards to the 10-year really up substantially, I would say the bond market's doing the tightening for them. So although rate hikes are potentially on the table for this year and could be part of the conversation, I really don't think they'll have to because the bond market will do the work for them. The cost of capital's going up. You're starting to see some uh, real estate starting to impact real estate. So it's the bond market's doing their job for them. Um, and that's the beauty of the capital markets. And when you come in and try to disrupt what the capital markets are doing, that's when you have these gyrations. So doing nothing here for the rest of this year and going in the next year gives us our best opportunity for success. Uh, anything other than that, I think it's gonna be a big problem. Eddie, let's stick on that point because it's just fun to disagree on stuff. <laughs> if if two thirds of the economy is made up of consumer spending, what impact does the bond market have on that? Particularly when you have so many consumers putting things on credit, uh, using buy now, pay later, and also with you know record breaking high yield savings accounts and dividend plays, there's so much capital and liquidity out there for the consumer. So look, rate, high rates right now, I would say are favorable for people that have money in savings, right? Because for the first time in over a decade, they're actually getting paid to have money in savings and money markets that are yielding. Many of them are yielding over 5%. So that's extra cash in the consumer's pocket. Look, at the end of the day, this zero interest rate policy that we had for such a long period of time caused people to get over their skis in debt. Um, and I think the consumer is going to get weaker uh, and rate cuts aren't going to solve any problems in regards to that. Economic cycles, if we just let them run their course and let the capital markets do what they'll do without trying to interfere any time there seems to be any headwinds, again, I think it's best to let the markets take care of themselves. But look, I think these higher rates are going to be a problem for the consumer. But again, you could see an environment where the Fed cuts rates but if the bond market doesn't go any lower, the cost of capital is still going to stay high. Uh, and, and that's something that I think we're going to have to deal with. This is the new normal. Uh, I don't think inflation is getting down to 2% anytime soon. Just look at what people are paying for food and gas. Uh, that's the real cost that everyday people and families are having to deal with. And I don't see a catalyst that the Fed can do to bring that down. The only thing that brings that down is a slowing of the economy, and you can keep it slowing down at a manageable pace if you keep rates right where they are.
You know, the Fed usually strips out uh, the volatile energy prices because of exactly what we're seeing play out right now. But, Eddie, let's talk about what this means for the investor out there. If you're trying to position yourself, you're saying that, hey, it doesn't really matter for the markets. The market can still trend higher regardless of what the Fed does next. How then should investors be positioned for that move to the upside? Well, I'll share with you what we did. Uh, so, you know, we have obviously getting a reset here. I mean, we sold uh, about a third of our equities and our tactical strategies on Monday morning during the rally, uh, because we do think we're having a reset right now of the realization that we're not going to be having rates lowered uh, substantially or maybe even at all. So right now we are taking a cautious stance because we think this uh, sell-off could accelerate. Um, and if they go after names like NVIDIA, like the other names, then you could really see a double-digit correction here. I want to stress that I think this correction is going to be extremely viable. We plan to buy them because at the end of the day, the economy is accelerating. Earnings, for the most part, are actually fine. This is just a normal correction that we have to go through and basically resetting to new rates. So I believe over the next four to maybe six weeks, you'll have some amazing buying opportunities maybe sooner than that. Uh, but I would take a cautious stance right now because the tech sector was over at skis in regards to how high it went. And we will be buying them again, but we're not ready to buy today. I think there's still downward pressure. And then you have the Middle East issue that I think will have to wait a couple of two to three weeks to see uh, what type of retaliation, if any. And that would certainly add fuel to the sell-off. All right, Eddie Gabor, great to have your insight here. Key Advisors Wealth Management, co-founder and CEO. Thanks. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. We got much more of your market action ahead. Again, now you're looking at gains across the board. This follows four straight days of decline. So this move higher in the markets and early action. Really notable here. You've got the Dow up just around 200. You've got the S&P trading to the upside, as well as the NASDAQ. The NASDAQ flipping back into positive territory. We'll be right back. Netflix earnings are coming up. Here are three things all investors need to watch out for. First and foremost is the reaction to Netflix earnings results. This stock is up 30% year to date, and you want to probably see, if you've been a bull on Netflix shares, you want to see the stock go up initially despite those year-to-date gains. If the stock gets clobbered, if it gets clobbered, that might be a signal that the broader overall stock market is overvalued and time to get the hell out. Number two, you want to see the how much of a lift financially Netflix is seeing from the company's new ad tier business. This was a key rollout for Netflix last year. A lot of folks on the street that I talk to want to see a big financial lift from this ad business finally starting to bear fruit. And then last thing, third thing you need to know about Netflix earnings and watch out for, what is the paid sharing lift? Netflix has really cracked down on everyone scrubbing passwords from various family members. And in the fourth quarter, they saw a 13 million uh, net additions number because they have cracked down on passwords. The street wants to see that number around seven or eight million this time around. If Netflix can deliver on that or even be it, the stock is probably going to go a lot higher.
2024 has been off to a rough start for Tesla and its CEO, Elon Musk, with shares of the EV maker down more than 35% this year, giving back a good chunk of the massive gains the name saw back in 2023, right now hitting their lowest level since January. It's now among the worst performers in the S&P 500, closely followed by another embattled company, Boeing. So how did we get here for Tesla? Well, back in January, they warned of notably slower sales growth that few investor concerns about stock demand and competition from China. CEO Elon Musk then said the company would be focusing on production of its new generation vehicle. That day, Tesla stock suffered its sharpest percentage drop in more than a year, with $80 billion wiped out in market value just in that day, a record-breaking drop. And then we had price cuts and more price cuts. At the beginning of the year, Tesla cut prices of the Model 3 and Model Y in China. The company also reported slowing China shipments spooking investors and sending shares to fresh lows. Then moving on to February, Tesla slashing prices in the U.S. off of its Model Y cars. That was less than a month after the car maker cut those prices in Germany. In March, things got worse. Deliveries for the company fell 20 percent from the previous quarter, marking the first year-over-year declines since 2020. And we should mention deliveries are the closest approximation of sales reported by Tesla, but they're not precisely defined in the company's shareholder communication, so it is an estimate. And just this week, the company cutting 10 percent of its workforce and a major executive resigning after 18 years at the EV maker. So amidst all that bad news, also Elon Musk did try to spark some optimism, optimism saying that the long-awaited robo-taxis would be unveiled in August, but that might not be enough for the street. The rough ride for the company leaving Wall Street feeling very bearish on this name. Over 60% of analysts had a buy rating on Tesla just last year. Now only 32% of analysts have a buy rating. Over 44% have a hold and 23% have a rare sell rating. Shauna? All right, Maddie, well, it certainly has been a very tough time here for Tesla. But despite all that, one analyst that we're going to talk to next still maintains his buy rating on Tesla, but says that the clock is striking midnight for Elon Musk because of many of those reasons that you just listed. So for more on that, we want to bring in Dan Ives of Webbush Securities. Dan, it's great to see you here. So I was just going through a recent note that you put out this week. You're saying that the clock has struck midnight for Elon Musk, that Tesla is going through a major, quote, Category 5 storm right now. Where do we go from here? I think we're going to find out Tuesday because this is probably the worst period that I've seen, I'd say, in about six years for Tesla. And patience is wearing thin. And you see from an investor perspective, and obviously, you know, many thrown in the towel, the long term story is still there. And, and that's why we remain bullish. But no doubt, I mean, this is white knuckle. And, and there could be darker days ahead if Musk does not handle the call. I think like an adult in the room and actually give some sort of vision and navigation with a lot of questions remaining. Dan, it's great to speak with you. Let's stick on this adult in the room concept because a lot of the challenge here for Tesla is that the fundamentals don't always match up with what Elon Musk is purporting about deliveries and, and company fundamentals. I know that you do a lot of traveling to Asia to take a look at what's going on beneath the hood for some of these manufacturers. What can you tell us from your experience on the ground that may not be making headlines or may not be making its way out of Elon Musk's mouth to investors? Look, right now, I, mean, I can tell you firsthand, I mean, China EV market, it's like the video thriller, Nightmare on Elm Street. I mean, pick your spot. It's been bad. Now, that's obviously been the huge headwind for Tesla, which is really, that's a key part of the growth, right, in terms of the China story. What I think investors need to hear is what's the strategy to turn this around? Are they going to maintain prices? And the big thing is Model 2. Like, you need Model 2 to have that growth story in the next 18, 24, 36 months. This cannot just be about autonomy five, six years from now. And I think that that's really the crucial point here that they need to get and he needs to get uh, on that conference call in terms of that point. Dan, what are you hearing or what are you expecting in terms of the timing of production of the Model 2? And if it doesn't happen according to plan, more specifically, what does that then downside risk look like? I mean, if they don't do Model 2 and went straight to autonomy, that would be like being at a cliff in the Grand Canyon and looking down below. 
I mean, the point is, it's a scary proposition because when when Tesla talks about two growth waves, the second wave is Model Two, refresh Model Three, Model One, and obviously some other, you know, models that they're going to introduce. But that's the issue right now in terms of Model Two. You cannot go straight autonomy. Now, obviously, some you know have reported it, and this is really what I view when I say clock striking midnight. It comes down from us. Navigate the Category 5 storm, just like he has in 18, 2020, and other. Otherwise, this is not just trust me, because I think that's really the frustration now that essentially is, you know, went from a Cinderella story magic carpet ride to what's been a bit of a horror show, especially the last three, three four months. Well, analysts are, in, and we're hearing from sources that the future of Tesla does really rely on cracking that driverless autonomy that you did mention. How how likely is that? Look, autonomy is going to be key, but that's we're not really going to see driverless, no steering wheels, 2030. And think about the regulatory involved here. So that sounds great on a PowerPoint and sci-fi. <laughs> in terms of what autonomy, and, and we do believe in the autonomous vision. But in the near term, it's about growth. What does free cash flow look like? How do you reverse the growth trend? How do you get to three, four, five million units? The only way you get there is with a sub 30K car, a Model 2. For, for a, get, a product line that really hasn't had a refresh since Model Y, Cybertruck continues to be limited that's not going to be mass market. And that's the issue here. This would almost be the equivalent of Apple being like, okay, iPhone 14, you're like iPhone 15, iPhone 16. Hey, just wait till the iPhone 24. Stay tuned. <laughs> that probably wouldn't work out too well for Apple side. No. <laughs> but, but, but that's also the difference between a tactician, yeah. a Hall of Famer like Cook versus what we're seeing with Musk, which has really been like a comedy show, a bad comedy show, the, the last few conference calls. So, Dan, let's talk about what you think is more realistic then when it comes to delivery numbers, when it comes to gross margin numbers. What do you think is more realistic of what we're going to see from Tesla then in the coming quarters? Give, just give real, for the, the coming thing, give guidance, right? So it's give what margins could look like. There'll be a lot of charges. Where does gross margins level out at? What's a realistic delivery number? Is it is it 1.95? Is it 2 million? What does growth look like? Like give the two to three year targets in terms of and that could be an analyst day. And then also they have to have the AI day in terms of the, where also Musk needs to recommit to keeping the AI initiatives at Tesla. Remember that you know, that threat, which obviously has ruffled a lot of feather, and, and that's a huge issue. Right. So we could talk about the proxy and the Delaware and moving to Texas, but there's a lot of issues right now that are uncertain. And that's why investors, and, you know, I hear it all day long, investors are just like too much risk with no pilot on the plane. And they don't want to see Ted Stryker as the pilot. So, Dan, super quick here. You sound pretty pessimistic. You're still a buy on the stock. What would it take to change your rating? Look, next week, I, they need to basically reaffirm the Model 2, reaffirm the low-cost vehicle, give a strategy in the next 6, 9, 12 months. This can't just be a trust-me autonomy. We'll be back to you in 2030. And that's why you're seeing many throw in the towel because of the fears and a lot of the reporting that surrounds that, along with the cost cuts that were definitely, you know, I'd say a little gut wrenching relative to a company that should, in theory, be in growth mode. All right, Dan, thanks as always for joining us and giving us the Mets uh, stuff in the background, as always. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Dan Ives is with Wedbush.
Now, sticking with tech, Apple CEO Tim Cook is at the tail end of his Southeast Asia tour. He is expected to be in Singapore today and tomorrow to meet with the country's next prime minister, who is set to start next month. He'll also meet with his predecessor. That is according to Bloomberg News. Now, Apple is on the hunt for new growth markets as things are starting to slow in China when it comes to iPhone sales. And this comes as Chinese tech giant Huawei begins selling the latest models of its smartphone. So joining us now to discuss the competition there is our very own Dan Howley. Dan. Yeah, that's right. So, I mean, look, this is part of Apple's long-term strategy of not only diversifying its customer base, but its production base as well. We saw during COVID how its over-reliance on China was basically uh, an Achilles heel for the company. They weren't able to get out iPhones as quickly as they wanted to. They weren't able to get Macs out as quickly as they wanted to. They kind of missed a wave. And then we see that kind of you know lump in the, uh, the earnings as a result, where there was that uh, initial period where they weren't getting all of that, those sales that people were going through when it comes for uh, uh, smartphones and, and laptops during COVID. Uh, then they had this huge wave where everything kind of came to market and they were able to hit that. Now uh, they're saying, okay, we don't want this to happen again. You know, God forbid something goes on geopolitically or something like that. Let's try to spread out where we're building devices. And that includes uh, India as well as these these other locations. I think the other thing to really watch out for uh, here is uh, the, the sales, as you kind of alluded to. They're trying to expand their sales base outside of China. Uh, they talk a lot about emerging markets, whether that's India, whether that's Brazil, uh, as well as uh, the likes of Vietnam uh, and uh, uh, Indonesia. So they're, they're really trying to expand beyond uh, China being such a huge market for them. Yeah, and, and to that end, though, obviously they need to diversify because of their reliance on China. They've been seeing, seeing stiffer competition, it seems like, by the day over there. What does their current market share look like? Because I believe it's been eroded, right, mm -hmm. in the most recent quarter. And then when you have even more competition from Huawei, what that could potentially then look like down the road. Yeah, so their, their global market share uh, has fallen uh, as of the most recent quarter. That's according uh, to IDC. Uh, they're supposedly going to be off about 10% iPhone shipments uh, year over year. So that's a, a big drop, right? And part of the, the reason for that is because we're seeing more uptake from uh, Chinese smartphone makers globally, right? So it's not just in China, it's, it's globally as well. We have uh, Huawei there with, with their new phone. Uh, you know, that's going to be another issue for them going forward. How can they fight back against these, these smartphone makers? to ensure that they stay top of mind and it's not just, you know, Huawei and, and those like. Right. It's a really good point because we've had a lot of guests saying that the demand is coming from Chinese consumers only wanting to go more homegrown, but it mm -hmm. sounds like it is a bigger problem. So, mm -hmm. Dan, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Appreciate you coming in. That was our very own Dan Howley covering all things tech for us. We are going to have all of your markets action ahead, so stay tuned for more. Still seeing green across your screen when it comes to the major averages. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Oil prices continue to slip this week down about 3% as fears over tensions in the Middle East perhaps starting to ease coming off of four days of losses when it comes to WTI. Joining us now to discuss what's going on with that bifurcation there is Bob Iaccino. He's Path Trading Partners co-founder and chief market strategist. Bob, thanks so much for being here. Explain this to me, right? Because we went into the week thinking that the geopolitical tensions that we've seen starting to bubble over, that was bullish that was supposed to be bullish for oil, and now we're seeing four days of losses. Well, it was short term, right? I mean, when you're looking at geopolitical tensions, you're looking at the ultimate thing being the supply disruption, and that didn't happen. When you had the sort of uh, massive attack from Iran into Israel that didn't turn out to be massive at the landing point, that kind of tempered the view that Israel was going to uh, reciprocate, or I should say respond, in a way that would disrupt the supply. Iran is not a small producer, despite the sanctions. Oil is fungible. Oil goes one place, and then that place doesn't want the demand from another place. So you're talking about a country that produces between 2.8 million barrels and 3.1 uh, per day, and that's not small. So when you consider that that could have been disrupted, the early move that we saw, the early trade from the speculators looking at that being a driver of crude oil was a big deal. Didn't materialize, still could. But when you're talking about the supply and demand dynamics that are going on longer term, this may turn out to be a pretty good buying opportunity. Technically, if you get below 79.50 in WTI, the June WTI futures, for example, and that sustains, then you worry about lower price levels. But outside of that, this is likely a buying opportunity because bigger picture, demand is likely to exceed supply in the medium term. Bob, when you talk about that move higher that we could see, what? how are you talking triple digit oil? What's going to bring that conversation, no. 100 bucks a barrel? What would bring that conversation, the extremely bullish view that we had seen back into play? Well, Shani, you're talking about geopolitics to get to $100 a barrel. Uh, that's what gets uh, these surprise shocks and sustainable shocks, depending on the assessed damage, if there were to be a geopolitical, I keep calling it geopolitical, we're obviously talking about a military strike that disrupts supply. Then that would get us somewhere near that $100 and possibly exceeding it, depending on what that disruption would be. So it could be dominoes, right? It could be an attack that disrupts supply and then a closing of the Strait of Hormuz because you saw during the pandemic and the supply disruptions with the supply chain that we had as a sort of a general economic factor, how to hurt the West. And Iran knows that if they wanted to hurt the West, that's the way they would do it is they would continue to disrupt supply even after a strike. So that's what would take us there. I'm talking about just a general supply and demand imbalance that's developing. We're about to go into the strongest seasonal tailwind for crude oil that we're going to get we get sort of a flat level in the end of April, and then it starts to spike in May through, say, late July, early August. That's a seasonal tailwind. We're going to have U.S. production tail off. And then higher interest rates slows the transition away from fossil fuels. So that's another dis demand spur. Fossil fuel projects need, or I should say like, but really need lower interest rates. So if rates are going to be higher for longer, or if the 10-year and further out is going to continue to rise, as some people having it moving up to 5%, that's going to disrupt supply slowly. And I realize when you're talking about some of these inflationary dynamics, it does make me think about the big November event that we have coming up with the presidential election and the degree to which the Biden administration is going to allow for oil prices to rise significantly heading into that date. To what extent should oil investors be thinking about strategic petroleum reserves and the impact that could have on the price of oil? Well, there's only so much that can do. After the first tranche of SPR releases that we got last year, the Department of Energy said it only affected gas prices by about 17 percent. I'm sorry, 17 cents, mm -hmm. which is very different from 17 <laughs> percent. That's from the Department of Energy. And these are temporary supply uh, distributions that have to go to refineries that may be overloaded in the first place. So it isn't necessarily going to translate to the pump in any sustained way. Also, we're very depleted in the SBR. So try and think about combining a massive supply shock through geopolitical events, possibly a closing of the straits, which Iran can do, likely won't, but it's possible, and a widely depleted, depleted SPR that got refilled by about 20, 25%, don't quote me on that percentage, 
But the power of the SBR is greatly diminished at this point. Bob, before we let you go, we want to quickly talk about the price of gold, because that's obviously been something that's on our radar. We're, at, we're right near yeah. those record highs. We had City on earlier this week talking about the fact that we could actually see 3000 an ounce. What do you think is likely at this point? How much higher do you see the price of gold headed? Well, I'm tired of City following me because about a year and a half ago, I said 2800 by the end of 2024. Somebody should call them and tell them to at least give me credit. I think 3000 <laughs> is a stretch. But I do think gold continues higher from here because from my perspective, there's three outcomes. You're only looking at rates from here staying at this level by the Fed or lowering them, right? Lowering them pushes gold higher, keeping them here. If we continue to get currency debasement, which is different than inflation, pushes gold higher. There is no talk of a Fed rate hike, which is the thing that would push gold lower. And then the secondary factor is gold is an asset and if we get renewed inflation, which I'm a believer that we're going to get, gold is an asset. Asset prices participate in inflation. Your home does, your land does, stocks do, and gold does. So there's not a lot of scenarios, at least as we speak right now, the three of us, that pushes gold that much lower. All right, Baba Gino, always great to talk to you. Thanks so much for hopping on with us this morning. Path Trading Partners co-founder and chief market strategist. Thanks. Keep right here on Yahoo Finance. Much more of your market action ahead. We'll be right back. Sector, we're continuing to watch this morning semiconductors. Shares of AMD and Intel both down over 16% in the last month. NVIDIA falling 10% from its all-time high that it hit back in March. Now, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index also dropping over 10% from its record highs, putting it into correction territory. For more on the recent moves we're seeing in the chip space, we are joined by Patrick Moorhead, more insights and strategy founder and CEO. Patrick, thanks so much for being with us this morning. Uh, Let's start with what we heard from TSMC. We had executives calling out some slowness that we might be seeing in terms of demand for the overall sector. Was that a warning sign that investors need to listen to for the rest of this earnings cycle? Yeah, so I think there's there's some conservatism that's going into what TSMC is bringing out. And I think it, it's, it's the part of the market that is an industrial industrial IOT that I think is 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 concerning when it comes to big silicon on bleeding edge process like what Nvidia and AMD and Intel and Qualcomm have there's no issues there one thing we should keep an eye on though is Apple 
right? We saw mm -hmm. a very large decline in Apple sales uh, from forecasts that we've been seeing in the industry. And that could have a little bit to do with that. Some of that is shifting over to some of the Chinese manufacturers. Patrick, is there no room for error from these uh, chip manufacturers this earnings season? Because even just judging by the reaction that we're seeing to TSMC's results and some of the commentary that we're seeing and the ripple effects that it's having more broadly speaking across the chip sector, it almost looks like they're priced to perfection at this point. So I think that's getting a little ahead of ourselves uh, on that. I mean, I think there is still this insatiable need for data center AI silicon. In fact, uh, a lot of NVIDIA's best parts have six, nine months lead, lead times still, and they just can't get enough. And every one of those AI installations typically have to be paired up with a modern CPU from Intel or one that's designed uh, from ARM. And then you have this upcoming, what I like to call the PC and smartphone super cycle that, that isn't being placed in. So I think we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here in some of the doom doom and gloom. I mean, there's a lot of TBDs when it comes to the inflation numbers and interest rates here in the United States and around the globe. And I think those, in addition to what is going on with the conflict in the Middle East, are giving people a, a little bit of a wait and see attitude. Hmm. So, Patrick, what's going to give investors more confidence? Because when you take a look at the reactions, at least this morning, is this a bit of an overreaction then, you think, to the downside? I think it's an overreaction. I mean, listen, the, the high-end semi-space and everybody in the value chain, uh, the stocks have, have just shot up like, like rockets. Uh, the AMDs, the NVIDIAs out there. And by the way, anybody affiliated with that, which is Amazon, Microsoft, Google, uh, and Meta, and I think you know this. This is just a a cautious blow, likely some profit taking and some jittery uh, reactions from what's going on with interest interest rates in the Middle East. So, really quickly here, Patrick, our final minute with you is every dip for some of these names viable at this point? It's really not. I mean, especially when, when you have a run like uh, companies like in, NVIDIA has and, and anybody who's related to that or a competitor to, to NVIDIA, I think people are playing a little game of chicken, which is, you know, they get a spurt of bad news and people want to sell, sell the name. And they realize that it's not a real gloom and doom and they jump right back in uh, uh, to their position. Patrick Moorhead, always great to have you. Thanks so much for coming on and joining us once again here at Yahoo Finance. Moorhead Insights and Strategy founder and CEO. Thanks so much. Thank you. Let's do a final quick check of the markets. Again, we're looking at gains across the board. All three of the major averages trading to the upside. You've got the Dow now up just over 300 points, right around the highs of the session. The S&P up about six tenths of a percent. And the NASDAQ also in positive territory. Well, coming up, our new show, Wealth, which is dedicated to all of your personal finance needs. Our very own Brad Smith is going to have you for the next hour, so stay tuned for more.
Hey, welcome to Wealth. I'm Brad Smith, and this is Yahoo Finance's newest guide to building your financial footprint. You know what it is. Our community of experts will give you the resources, tools, tips, and tricks that you need to grow your money. On today's show, housing inflation. We'll discuss elevated costs and what it'll take to bring some relief to the market here. And, oh yeah, are you still watching? Netflix earnings after the bell, they're coming forward. We'll discuss how the streamer's password crackdown is impacting your wallet or purse or pocketbook, whatever you're using to store cash and money. Plus, invest like the rich will reveal the luxury items that you can invest in that gain value over time. But first, Let's take a look at some of the market action. 90 minutes into the trading session, Yahoo Finance's Madison Mills has you covered with the three things you need to know that are moving markets right now. Hey, Maddie. Hey, Brad. Thanks so much. We are looking at some upside movement, reversing what was a mixed picture earlier today. Stocks looking to recover after the S&P and NASDAQ closing lower on Wednesday. That was after four straight days of declines. Taking a look at green across your screen here. But some of the downside pressure we're seeing is coming from tech, specifically NVIDIA. That is one of our top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance this morning. Now, the Dow has also had a tough week. It's off for a seventh session in the past eight investors sort of parsing the latest earnings reports and new fed commentary we just had cleveland fed president loretta mester the latest to say on wednesday that the fed will cut at some point but why be in a hurry why do it too quickly we also have a number of chip stocks that are our top trenders on yahoo finance this morning specifically tsmc taiwan semi beating on revenue and profit really beating across the board thanks to strong ai chip demand but we are seeing that stock in the red down about 4%. And that is because the company's CEO cut the overall growth outlook for the global semiconductor space, kind of trimming expectations there. And that is fueling a broader chip sell-off. iShare Semiconductor ETF is off this morning, down about six-tenths of a percent there. This may be a natural pullback because of so much hype priced in. A bit of a buy the rumor, sell the news event here. That's what we just heard from our guest, Patrick Moorhead, as well. You mentioned, Brad, investors watching that Netflix earnings print to come for the first quarter today. The streaming giant up more than 25% year to date. Now, subscriber growth really in focus after strong results in the fourth quarter. Investors are eager to see that continuing, particularly due to Netflix's password sharing crackdown here, Brad. All right, Maddie, thanks so much for teeing up what we're going to be watching later today, plus what we're keeping tabs on here in the markets right now. We also got a fresh read on the health of the real estate market this morning. The National Association of Realtors released its monthly existing home sales report for the month of March. According to the data, existing home sales fell 4.3% from the month prior. This comes after sales jumped over 9% in February. So what does this all really mean? Well, existing home sales are exactly what they sound like. We're looking at the volume of houses purchased that were already owned and occupied before coming to market. This report looks at single family properties, condos and co-ops nationwide. According to the NAR, existing homes typically represent roughly 90% of overall residential sales. So the category is considered to be a broad indication of the health of the real estate market. So a fall in this index could signal a decline in demand for homes. We also saw home builders start construction on fewer homes during March, and it all comes down to mortgage rates here as well. Now hovering just under that 7% level. So what does it mean for prospective buyers of homes out there? Well, there may be less competition, but financing and prices seem to remain a sticking point here. And for more on this and staying in the real estate sector as housing prices are on the rise, the average home price for the four weeks ending April 14th, just over $380,000, a nearly 5% increase over the last year, and just about $3,000 short of June 2022's all-time high here. That data according to Redfin. So now, what do the costs and rising costs in housing mean for your dollar? Joining me now is Mark Fleming, who is the first American chief economist here. Great to have you here on the program with us. That's a lot of data that we just rattled off to our <laughs> folks. We know that you track it all, though, as the chief economist. And as we're continuing to think about what the moderation and prices signal about demand right now, I wonder what you're extrapolating from this data. 
Well, the, the actual rise in mortgage rates has a demand side effect. Obviously, it makes homes less affordable. You, you know, you can you can't leverage your income as much to buy the the house. But at the moment, it's also affecting the supply side, and that is those existing homeowners and their willingness to sell. And so the dynamic of their willingness to sell because you know it costs a lot if you give up the low mortgage rate that you already have is restricting supply. So rising rates restrict supply. They also restrict demand. The net effect isn't necessarily falling prices or rising prices. It's at this point basically a cooling of the amount of volume, as we saw in the home sales report today, less homes being sold. But prices are probably still going to keep going up at somewhere around the 5 to 6% range because of the interplay between demand and supply. Certainly. What is it going to take, do you believe, for more supply to come into the market? Well, one thing that would help would be getting rid of this higher for longer world of mortgage rates, right? <laughs> yes. Uh, because um, as it restricts both supply and demand, lower rates would incent supply and incent demand. Uh, but other than that, I think the, the broader good news is people buy and sell homes, and people in, in particular sell homes for many more reasons than just the financial effect. So while it might cost them financially to give up that low mortgage rate, we have seen increased supply since last year, modestly, because People move for other reasons, death, divorce, change of jobs, bigger home, things like that. And the longer we sort of stay in this higher rate environment, the more those kinds of things become the important driving factor for people moving. Yeah, certainly. And, and, and all things considered with the higher for longer that we've continued to hear. And I was just taking a look at the CME FedWatch probability, especially as it relates to when they will cut or when they may cut or when the markets are expecting to cut. And if you had asked many of those who were looking at this figure a month ago, we would have seen that the markets would have anticipated that we had see, we would see two cuts by September. But that's changed dramatically. And now the first cut that we're firmly expecting to see is by September. So all of that considered, if we do see less cuts than anticipated, how does that create a, a kind of longer um, supply side dynamic, dynamic within this market as well? Well, if you go back to December, I think people were drinking too much eggnog. They thought it was going to be six or seven cuts this year. It was good eggnog. All right. <laughs> good eggnog. Don't right? hate us for it, Mark. That's clearly off the table. You know, we're talking about maybe two cuts. And honestly, what if there were no cuts? And that just means the status quo. Everyone gets used to this rate environment. And honestly, a 7% mortgage rate, while we think it's astronomically high relative to recent years past, that's actually much closer to the normal for a mortgage rate historically. While we have you here, Mark, moving over to the rental market, what trends are you seeing right now? Well, there is some good modest news in the rental market because so much rental has been built in the last couple of years that's all coming to market this year. So we have sort of a supply glut. That's not the problem in the existing market, right? right. Here, a lot of supply is coming to market in some, mar in some places, and that's really putting a damper on rent growth which means essentially, you know, if you want to get into renting, now is a pretty good time because there's going to be excess supply relative to demand. And that's not going to last because as household formation picks up again in the coming years and that supply gets all absorbed, we're going to get to a tight market again. So the supply dynamic, supply demand dynamic in multifamily is actually quite good right now. As you look across the, and, and just lastly, as we end out this, I mean, th this is amazing because there are some buildings, high rises, and this might be New York specific, but I imagine it's in a lot of other metropolitan areas that we're assuming there would be more people that would be coming in droves back to office, more people moving back into cities after many people dispersed on the onset of COVID. That hasn't necessarily happened at the pace anticipated, which means you have less of the units that go uh, occupied. And now we're shifting the conversation from, in some of these high rise cases, ownership towards just renting. How does that additional capacity or additional supply have a effect on the prices that the rest of those who are already into the rental market may eventually be able to benefit from at some point? I think you bring up the point that uh, it matters where the supply is. And so excess supply in a downtown market might be the case, as well as not enough supply in the suburban market to that same mm. city center, right? Housing is an immovable good. 
it's it's placed where it is and it has to meet the demand where it is. And so in many cases, you can have mismatches, particularly in the urban cores, because clearly the challenge is incenting people to want to live in the urban core if they're not necessarily working there five days a week anymore. Mark Fleming, first American chief economist. Thanks so much for taking the time here with us today, Mark. Appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Coming up, everyone, we speak to Senator Cynthia Lummis on her proposed stablecoin regulatory bill. Yeah, we've got some news for all you crypto curious folks out there. That's right after the break. The job market is hot. Hundreds of thousands of jobs are being added to the economy every month. But at the same time, layoffs continuing to sweep the U.S., hitting almost every sector this year. Just this week, Morgan Stanley, Take-Two, and Tesla announced job cuts. And with more than a year of ongoing cuts, workers are starting to feel the pressure of holding on to their jobs. For more on this, I'm joined by Corey Staley, who is the Indeed Hiring Lab economist. Great to have you on the program here. I mean, you guys have a trove of data as it relates to the number number of jobs that are listed, but now we're talking about something on the other side as well and some of the positions that get cut and perhaps cycled into some of the new build-out efforts or scaling efforts that some companies may have. I, I, just broad strokes to start things off, what are you seeing in the data? Overall, what we're seeing in the data, you know, we've definitely heard a lot about these layoffs. What's interesting, though, is right now these layoffs are still kind of more in the news rather than in the full data set. What we're seeing is that the overall layoff rate has still remained pretty low. 
Now, with that being said, obviously, if you're you know on the receiving end of a layoff, you know it's going to hit very, very different, and we're going to have to really watch to see you know if it becomes more of a trend. But right now, the overall labor market is still stable, is still strong. We got initial claims data today on unemployment claims that showed that things are pretty stable. They were flat and unchanged from last week. You know, so there are still some signs that the labor market is stable steady despite what we've seen in some of these recent layoffs. And we're going to get to some actionable tips for people who have been impacted as well here. Uh, you know, I, I wonder, and we continue to hear this word reskilling tossed around, especially as it relates to some of the new advancements in technology. How much of that are you seeing as it relates to kind of the, the positions that are trimmed and then relisted as a different type uh, or with different qualifications for a company that's still doing some hiring. It's always hard to tell exactly what's going on in some of these layoffs, right? A lot of this ends up being, you know, companies taking a job, cutting it here and maybe hiring or moving resources around into other areas. And a lot of that information happens on the company level. And that's not something that we always have visibility into. But one of the things we can see is we look at Indeed uh, data, we look at job posting data, we can see that there are some clear trends and some clear patterns. For instance, if we look at software development jobs, there's been a really clear pullback far beyond average, uh, where we've seen much less demand for employers posting jobs for software developers. But on the other side of the coin, we've also seen a pretty big and pretty consistent uh, steady hiring for jobs in healthcare for jobs in construction, manufacturing, some areas that have been kind of surprising given the current interest rate uh, environment that we're in. What, what are you seeing in terms of moderation in wages right now? In terms of wages, what we see at, through Indeed, you know, we can see kind of the overall obvious government data. And we've seen, you know, from the government data that there's been some slowing in wages, you know, from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. But what's interesting is with Indeed data, we can also look at the wages that are being advertised in job postings. So this is before anybody's even hired, before they've accepted the job. You know, what are new people being hired at? And what we've seen on Indeed data is a pretty consistent decline. That was in March, that number was down to about 3.1% wage growth, which is in line with what we saw before the pandemic. So again, steady decrease in wages and back to about where we were in 2019. You know, wanted to get back to the actionable tips here. I mean, we started off this conversation talking about or teeing up the conversation with some of the layoffs that had taken place. Morgan Stanley, Take-Two Interactive, Tesla. For those that find themselves on the bad end of some of these corporate cuts, what can they do next? What are some actionable tips that they can put into effect in order to get that new position? I think the first step is to really just take a deep breath and just step back. You know, whenever we have kind of these big adjustments, these big changes, you know, individuals, it can be really, really hard to kind of get that big perspective. So I'd say take a step back, take a deep breath. The big perspective right now, again, is kind of where we talked about that ultimately there are you know, we've seen these layoffs picking up, but by and large, there are still more opportunities available now than there were even before the pandemic. So if we look at job postings on Indeed, right now there's still almost 17% more job postings than there were before the pandemic. So there are still opportunities out there. One of the things I would add though, as a caveat to that, is as we start to look at different sectors and different industries, it's not always the same opportunity. I mentioned that you know software development has definitely pulled back a lot more. We've seen other tech areas like information design has pulled back, marketing, media, and communications. But there are areas where employer demand still remains really hot. So hmm. for those people who have maybe they're kind of thinking about reskilling, maybe going towards something else, looking at a career change might be an option at this time. Um, and if you're not looking for a career change, that's fine too looking to maybe upskill and focus on those kind of human skills. Some of the new kind of hot technologies like generative AI, right. you know, is another potential area that you can look at for potential scaling up opportunities to really set yourself apart in a labor market where it's become a little trickier in some sectors. Corey, I only got about 30 seconds left here. I want to end on a fun note. To what extent have you seen any data or any success stories come through about people who are using generative AI to write their cover letter or to rejigger perhaps their resume? 
Uh, so without diving into any specific, we've definitely seen a lot of great use cases for generative AI and people being able to take their resume and match it up with a job description and be able to look at the skills difference between those and help have generative AI effectively help them to identify areas and gaps in ways that they can improve. Um, and so there are a lot of creative things job seekers can do with these types of technologies that can really help them to give them a little bit of a leg up when they're looking for jobs. All right, that a little bit of a bonus tip there. Corey, thanks so much for taking the time here today. Corey Staley, who is the Indeed Hiring Lab economist, thanks so much for taking the time. Thanks for having me. Certainly. Turning now to some news that you need to know. Some of the top trending tickers on Yahoo Finance right now. First up, we got to talk about shares of Alaska Airlines. You're seeing them there on your screen higher, 6.5%, rising after forecasting second quarter and full year earnings above estimates. This is another sign that strong travel demand prevails right now. And the move higher comes despite the airline taking a Q1 loss, stemming from the grounding of Boeing jets after the blowout of a door plug on a 737 MAX 9 in January. And home builder DR Horton is raising its full year revenue guidance as a slowdown in housing supply boosted sales for the home builder. Not enough existing homes are available for prospective buyers, so Home builders have been doing well in the past year, up over 46%, 48% now for the S&P Home Builder ETF, as you're seeing there on the screen. And Bitcoin is the talk of the town, hovering, and today up by about 5%, ahead of the halving, an event every four years when the reward for Bitcoin mining is cut in half, reducing the amount of coins in circulation. And for you, the halving might bring a rally, it might bring a rally to the currency, maybe. Just maybe. We'll just have to wait and see, though. There you're taking a look at BTC USD up by about 4.8%. We've got much more on wealth after the break. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
While the crypto world is abuzz with the talk of the upcoming Bitcoin halving, let's take a brief reprieve here and discuss another side of crypto, one less susceptible to price swings and volatility, stablecoins. Stablecoins are a type of digital token designed to carry a fixed value, and because of that, they're less susceptible to volatility because they are backed by another asset, the fixed value. In theory, is a ballast against dramatic day-to-day -day fluctuations like those seen in Bitcoin and Ethereum. There are four main types of stablecoins, though, that you need to know about. Fiat-backed, crypto-backed, commodity-backed, and algorithmic. The most utilized type of stablecoin is fiat-backed, such as finance. For those stablecoins, an entity issues an amount of coins representative of an actual amount of currency that they hold. For example, 100 million coins backed by $100 million. Investors would then be able to use their new coins to exchange with other blockchain-based assets, and those who already own cryptocurrencies could convert their holdings into stablecoins, which would be redeemed for fiat currency. Now, regulators, they've been debating for years the best way to place guardrails around stablecoins within the financial system, especially after the failures of algorithmic stablecoins in the space, such as the 2022 deep peg and collapse of Terra, which wiped out $50 billion in total crypto valuation, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. There is new bipartisan bill swirling now aimed at a regulatory framework for stablecoins that would protect consumers. And we have the perfect guest to talk about this, Republican Senator from Wyoming, Cynthia Lummis, alongside Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schoenberger. Jennifer, I'll toss things on over to you. Thanks so much, Brad. That's right, Senators. Cynthia Lummis and Kirsten Gillibrand rolling out brand new legislation to regulate stable coins. Senator Lummis joins me now. Senator, always great to see you. Thanks so much for being here. It's great to see you, Jen. And by the way, that was a fabulous little primer on uh, stable coins. Well done. Well, thank you. And, and building on that, you know, how does this new bill protect consumers, especially when it comes to runs on stable coins, akin to the one we saw when Circle, the largest U.S. stable coin issuer, ended up breaking the buck when we learned that billions of its reserves were tied up in the failure of Silicon Valley Bank? Well, our bill uh, requires uh, 100% uh, hard currency backed uh, stable coins. Uh, we don't allow algorithmic stable coins uh, and we require that stable coins in the United States pursuant to our bill uh, be 100% asset backed. Now that could be hard currency like US dollars. It could also be US treasuries uh, or other um, assets that are uh, commonly recognized in the fiat world uh, and very much pegged to the U.S. dollar. What happens, Senator, if a stablecoin issuer fails? Will holders of that stablecoin be made whole, just like depositors in a bank when a bank fails? Well, the short answer is yes, and the way that the legislation tries to provide for that is multiple. Uh, one is, if the issuer is a bank, again, they have to be 100% hard asset backed. It's not like a fractional reserve, like normal banking assets. Uh, then if it's issued by a non-bank, a trust company, uh, the trust company would have to have a separate custodian uh, to make sure that um, the uh, stable coin backing is not on the balance sheet of other app for use uh, for other purposes. Um, so it's it's definitely sequestered in a way that would protect um, the users. Um, and then in the event of a, um, a failure uh, of a, a company, uh, we are incorporating the FDIC uh, receivership and conservatorship language and incorporating it uh, into uh, the stablecoin world. So if there's an insolvency, there's a process to protect uh, the holders of the assets. So given that banks and non-banks can issue stablecoins under this legislation, curious how this legislation would deal with PayPal uh, and its issuance of a stablecoin and whether a retailer like Walmart or Meta who may want to rebroach issuing a stablecoin, how that would work under your legislation if that's possible. 
Well, the issuers could be uh, a bank or a non-bank trust company. Uh, so I'm assuming that uh, if it is one of the entities that you just mentioned, that they would go the non-bank uh, trust company route, that they would have to use a um, custodian that is sort of subcontracted for this purpose. Or in if they're doing other business, which all of the entities that you named are, they would have to have uh, their stablecoin business walled off from their non-stablecoin activities. Um, so we think we're providing enough flexibility uh, to innovate uh, in this space in the United States and also providing consumer protections. Uh, our, our goal is to find that sweet spot, to make sure that we are innovating and not only innovating, but leading in the United States in this space. We don't want to see our failure to legislate and uh, have a clear rules of the road uh, for Americans. Uh, we want to make sure that this industry is robust, strong, innovative, and very present within uh, the United States. We don't want companies to have to go to Europe or elsewhere uh, to find a clear re regulatory framework that they can use. Um, there are safeguards, such as um, if um, a U.S. issuer uh, uh, issues uh, and knowingly uh, fails to comply, there are fines. Uh, and there are uh, abilities to uh, issue from the existing dual banking system. The states and the federal government will both have opportunities here. Um, there are different regulatory mechanisms if you're under a $10 billion business versus over a $10 billion business. Uh, states would be uh, more uh, able to regulate an, in an under $10 billion stablecoin business. So we've tried to provide enough flexibility uh, with regard to the choices of entities, whether bank or non-bank, whether state or federal, uh, to uh, people issuing stablecoins, but still allowing them to innovate. So if you had a PayPal, which is clearly larger than $10 billion, uh, there's a regulatory framework for them to use uh, that would be different from, say, a startup. What's your plan to get this bill into law, Senator? Or will it go as an individual uh, bill through committee, or do you think it could be attached to some sort of larger must-pass legislation? And what are the odds, do you think, that this thing, this bill, could actually pass? Is there enough support in the Senate? Are you working with members of the House that have their own version of a stablecoin bill? Uh, Senator Gillibrand and I are working uh, with members of the House, particularly uh, Patrick McHenry and Maxine Waters, the chairman and uh, ranking uh, minority member, respectively, uh, of the House Financial Services Committee. Uh, we have entertained a variety of vehicles that this might be attached to. So we're working with uh, Senate leaders to see if there is a preferred vehicle that the stablecoin bill could ride along with. Um, we do believe that the stablecoin component of the regulatory framework that Senator Gillibrand and I have laid out for all digital assets, including uh, digital assets that are commodities like Bitcoin, uh, digital assets that are securities and would be regulated by the SEC, uh, non-fungible tokens, uh, CDBCs. Uh, we've created this regulatory framework uh, for each of those contemplated digital assets. The one that seemed to rise to the top in 2024 as having the most legs uh, to get across the finish line this year is the stable coins component. So we pulled it out of the larger Lummis Gillibrand bill um, we put in the language of the FDIC uh, insolvency provisions to add that added layer of protection to make sure that if there is a conservatorship or a receivership that we're using procedures that already exist and with which banks are familiar uh, to have that kind of an insolvency uh, protection. 
Uh, and we are ready and able to work with McHenry and Waters and anyone else who's interested. Now that our bill's been filed, uh, it's also out there for uh, the stablecoin industry to look at and comment on and get back to us. Uh, so we can make sure that it's had adequate vetting uh, before it moves forward. We're looking forward to marrying our bill with uh, a House version and then see whether the House uh, has the political heft to move it forward or whether the Senate moving it first is the preferred option. Uh, so as you can see, procedurally, uh, we're looking at all available avenues to try to get a stablecoin bill across the finish line in 2024. All right. Well, Senator, please keep us posted on this progress. We'll have to leave the conversation there. But thank you so much, as always, for your insight. My pleasure, Jen. Thanks for uh, thanks for reporting on this. We think we're making headway. Of course. That's Senator Cynthia Lummis. You're watching Yahoo Finance. We'll be right back after this. Netflix is set to report its fiscal first quarter earnings after the market closed today. Investors are going to be eyeing the company's revenue initiatives, like its crackdown on password sharing. And it's been a little over a year since the streaming giant rolled out that feature. Just how much has 
it impacted consumers' wallets. Yahoo yeah, Finance senior reporter Alexandra Canal here with more. Hey, Alex. Hey, Brad. Yes. Yeah, so, in most simple terms, what does this mean? It means all those Netflix freeloaders yeah. have now had to get their own accounts and therefore pay more. Now, like you said, Netflix rolled out this initiative about a year ago. At the time, they said 100 million users globally were sharing accounts. Now, analysts have said at this point, Netflix has only scratched the surface on targeting those users and that there's definitely more room to run when it comes to converting those members to paying subscribers. And if you're a consumer, you have a few options here. You have a cheaper ad-supported tier that costs $6.99, the standard plan ad-free at $15.99, then the premium plan, which is also ad-free at $22.99. Now, for me, I was hit with the password sharing crackdown. I will admit, Ooh. I was on my parents' account, and I did opt for the ad-supported tier because to me, I'm not paying 16 bucks to watch Netflix when you have all of these other services and subscriptions. So I said, okay, I'll pay the 6.99. Okay. Honestly, not too bad. I don't think the ad load is that crazy. But but that's really what this company wanted. They want those freeloaders that are converting to subscribers to opt for that cheaper ad plan because one, it builds up that offering. It is another way to monetize those users and it will over time increase average revenue per member, something that's been referred to as ARM and that's a key profitability metric for Netflix. But, you know, a, a few weeks ago we were talking about a report from Deloitte that said consumer subscribe to four streaming services and pays about $61 per month on just those streaming services. Right. But that obviously depends on the tier plan. It depends on, you know, how, how much you want to take on as a consumer. So right now, although there's a lot of consumer choice, it is forcing users to pay a bit more than they probably were used to about a year or two ago. All right. We're going to be tracking shares of Netflix going into okay. and coming out of that report as well. Allie, thanks so much. Yes. Appreciate it. Thank you. Well, the financial world has lit up over the past year plus with talk of artificial intelligence. And one company's name seems to pop up more than others here. NVIDIA, shares of the AI darling are up over 200% over the past 52 weeks. Now, you might have heard coworkers or friends talking about their confidence in the stock, whether that be at the water cooler or at the barbecue, and thought to yourself, wait, I don't even really know what NVIDIA does. Well, have no fear because our very own Dan Halley is here with me in studio to tell you everything that you need to know about NVIDIA, but we're too afraid, or some might be too afraid to ask Dan. So let's start broadly. Just tell us what NVIDIA is, how long it's been around, and what exactly they do. Yeah, this is uh, dedicated to my dad who probably thinks that NVIDIA is some kind of, I don't know, laxative or something, something like that, I don't know. <laughs> He's, yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so NVIDIA was founded in 1993 with the, the basic goal of running uh, graphics processors, right? So the processors that would power uh, PC video games. Uh, they eventually uh, started working with the likes of Microsoft and Sony. Uh, they credit themselves with creating the first graphics processing unit. Uh, and so they really were basically meant for gaming. And I think the, the idea that uh, they are in AI now, has to do with uh, two major milestones. Uh, there was one uh, in 2006 when they released uh, their CUDA software. That's basically a software that allows developers to take a GPU uh, and let it run general processing. So you would have a CPU, your central processing unit, the what we usually call the brains of the computer, doing the general processing normally. Uh, a GPU, though, uh, allows for what's called parallel processing. So rather than in a CPU, you have a certain number of lanes uh, that are, are doing uh, tasks. On a GPU, you can have uh, far more lanes running the same data at the same time or, or data at the same time so that you're able to complete tasks much faster. So that goes into this whole AI thing. In 2012, uh, a pair of researchers, including uh, one future executive at a uh, board member at OpenAI, uh, they were able to use NVIDIA GPUs uh, to form neural networks, AI neural networks, and, and find a picture of a cat or, or pull up a picture of a cat and so uh, identify a picture of a cat. And so from there, NVIDIA was like, okay, well, this seems really good. Right. Why don't we start investing in this? And so they started going whole hog into this. And the, at that point, everyone thought that Jensen uh, Huang, the, the CEO, was a madman. You have all this money that you're making billions of dollars on video games. Just stick to what you know, man. Sure. Uh, and so uh, they ended up pouring money into this. And lo and behold, ChatGPT hits OpenAI with, uh, uh, you know, blows up. And now all these companies are just clamoring to get 
these these chips. So it's not just Nvidia alone out there. We got to remember who are some of their biggest competitors. Yeah, I mean, some of the the big competitors are really the the names that you already know and love, or maybe don't love. I don't know. Uh, Intel and AMD. Uh, AMD is probably its biggest competitor, and has been for years. Uh, they uh, uh, they used to have a they have a graphics card arm as well as a, a, a CPU arm. So they're basically fighting Nvidia and Intel at the exact same time in different spaces. Mm. Uh, but the the idea is that they have a new uh, chip called the uh, the MI series, the MI three hundred series, and so they say that that can compete with Nvidia's chips. Intel has its Gaudi series, its Gaudi three chip, mm. says it can compete with Nvidia's chips, but they don't account for Nvidia's new Blackwell chip. So uh, Intel and AMD they were focused on Nvidia's Hopper series of chips, the H one hundred, the H two hundred. There's a lot of numbers and, and letters, <laughs> but basically what it means is Nvidia had a chip, everybody was gunning for it. Right. They got close or next to it. Uh, but then NVIDIA said, you know, hold my beer, I'm going to go ahead and come out with an even better one. So, so these companies are trying. It's also their customers. Their customers are building chips now. Right. So Google, Microsoft wants to build it. They're not there. Uh, Amazon. So they're, they're all trying to get into this to try to beat NVIDIA in some way. Just lastly, we had mentioned the stock price over the past 52 weeks. How has NVIDIA actually been performing as of late? We think about this year to date and, and what investors should expect going forward. For year to date, they're up 70% uh, over the last 12 month, months. They're uh, over 200%. They make everything else look like it's just standing still. Even Meta, which jumped massively after they announced that dividend Good, and yeah. that, that uh, share buyback plan, uh, they, they went gangbusters. I think they went up 20% uh, on the day uh, when that was announced, but makes them look absolutely ridiculous. NVIDIA just absolutely dominating. And just a just quickly to put a point on how good they're doing as far as revenue goes. In their last quarter, they had $22.1 billion in revenue. That was up from $6.1 billion in the same quarter the prior year. Mm -hmm. And their full year revenue last year was $27 billion. So in last quarter, they nearly hit all of the revenue for the prior year. And we're expecting them to obviously have another bang out quarter. I think the problem comes when you start lapping this, right? right. This explosive growth doesn't last people are going to say, well, where's, where's my 300% growth or whatever? And, yeah. you know, it's law of large numbers, people. So, yeah. Yeah, creates tough comps for sure here. And we're going to be watching closely when the company does report their next uh, earnings slate here. We know that that is set to come May 22nd mm -hmm. as well here. Dan, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, living in the life and lap of luxury, we dive into the wealth trade. What are the rich buying? How much of a return are they getting on some of those investments? We'll learn all about, all about it next.
Lifestyles of the rich and famous seem so luxurious, and while we may not be able to spend like them, we can take a peek into the world every once in a while. Are wealthy shoppers over clothes and bags? According to Knight Frank's Wealth Report, handbag values were down 4% in 2023. So what kind of luxury goods are people buying right now? Here to let us know, we've got Sasha Skoda, who is the Real Real Vice President of Merchandising. Thanks so much for taking the time here today. I, I just got to know what I need to purchase for it to actually accrue more value over time, even though I want to go out there and flaunt and, you know, make sure that everybody knows, hey, yeah, it's that bag that you all saw, uh, and it's actually gaining value at this point. What is the hot topic? What's the hot item right now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, the notes that you had earlier around handbags, um, Handbags are actually one of the categories where we're seeing increase in value, um, particularly a brand like Hermes. And so a brand like Hermes is something that you and I, we could not walk into an Hermes store today and walk out with an Hermes Birkin or an Hermes Kelly, for example. And due to the scarcity of those items, they do increase in value over time. In general, we see these bags sell on average for up to 25% more than the original price. And depending on the profitability and the style, they can sometimes go for up to three times more than the original retail price. Wow. Okay. All right. So that's the bag side. What else are the other hot items that typically accrue a little bit more value? Yeah, so we're looking at the hard luxury goods then, so fine jewelry and watches. Um, fine jewelry is kind of interesting right now. Typically, you're going to see branded fine jewelry, right? So brands like Tiffany, uh, Cartier, Van Cleef and Arpels. Um, but more recently, we're actually seeing trends in unbranded jewelry. And so I'm sure, as you know, the price of gold has skyrocketed this year, and that's driving up the prices of unbranded, uh, you know, 18 karat gold fine jewelry. So you're going to see classic pieces like necklaces, rings, earrings, and again, an 18 karat gold, those are going to have really strong resale values right now. What luxury items are people selling? Where are you seeing the most listings come in from? Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is actually we see similar trends amongst buying and selling. I think that if you think about the nature of the, the cycle of these luxury goods, right, if you have customers in the primary market who are going out and wanting to purchase a new handbag, they're probably having a one-in, one-out mentality, right? So they're going back into the closet. They're going to consign one of their old handbags. And, and those are that's where we're seeing the demand on our side as well. So we actually see really similar trends in terms of what people are buying and selling. And I would say right now, handbags and fine jewelry are our two hottest categories. All right. You didn't mention any of my sneakers, so I guess I'll sit on those or maybe just wear them outside. Sasha Skoda, <laughs> who is the Real Real Vice President of Merchandising, thanks so much for taking the time. Of course. Thanks for having me. Definitely. Well, after you've bought all your luxury wares, you need a nice, big luxury home to put it all in with a California closet, perhaps. High interest rates are a hurdle, but one wealthy one, the wealthy more easily jump than the rest of us, and many plan to. 22% of wealthy individuals want to invest in residential property this year, and 19% in commercial property, according to Knight Frank's Wealth Report. Joining us now for more on this, we've got Liam Bailey, Knight Frank's global head of research and editor of the Wealth Report. That just dropped. So take us into some of the findings there. What was the, the stat that really just sent you slack jawed after finding into South in this report? Okay, so the, I think the, the biggest takeaway from this year's report is the fact that wealth creation is back. Okay. So a year ago, we were reporting that um, there'd be a $10.1 trillion wipe off in terms of wealth portfolios. Over the past 12 months, because of what's happened to equity markets, crypto, et cetera, et cetera, um, wealth creation is back, the world economy is delivered. And therefore, there are more wealthy individuals at a global level. You've just mentioned the stats that there is a continued interest in real estate in terms of their portfolios. Mm -hmm. The challenge, of course, is interest rates have done what they've done. And therefore, there is, a, there is a pre there's pressure in, in, in the markets, but there is still a demand for accommodation. I think the, the biggest surprise probably is the fact that despite the fact that rates have risen, that luxury markets, but also even mainstream markets, have seen prices for residential property rise right. over the past kind of six, nine months. A lot of that is down to the fact there's very limited inventory right now. So actually, the lack of stock means that actually demand has been pushing prices higher. It's particularly interesting, and in, you know the amount of anecdotal evidence around people applying for passports because the luxury and the wealthy are purchasing more properties that are international. What are you seeing on that front? It's become I mean, the, the whole uh, world of luxury real estate has become much more globalized, and it's interesting. 
you go back sort of five years, you, you were seeing US buyers in, say, London, for example. The last two, three years, suddenly you're seeing US buyers beginning to be big in uh, Lisbon, in Portugal, Spain, Italy. There's a whole host of markets, the luxury kind of end of the market in the European um, sectors where US buyers are now beginning to impact on demand and also on, in terms of pricing. That's one way to get into a uh, four-day work week, just getting that siesta baked in, Absolutely. cutting out some of those hours here. You know, Liam, while we have you as well here, you, you look across some of these CRE, some of the commercial real estate, some extreme moves that we're tracking there right now, especially with the diminishing amount of office hours that are spent and the revaluation of a lot of that property too. Yeah, you can't. Yeah, you've got to take a step back. There is no doubt there is a there is a significant issue facing office um, sectors ar around the globe. I would say probably the U.S. is a little more uh, behind in terms of the kind of return to the office. I think the U.K. Europe is a, is a bit more ahead of the curve. The direction of travel, I think, is back over time. I don't think we'll get back to five days a week, but we're getting back to more normalised kind of practices. But the biggest shift we're seeing is the fact that. The office market is kind of split into two. There is a huge demand for best-in-class offices. So you're, if, you're, if you run a professional services firm, 10% of your cost is your office space. Most of your cost is your people. You're in the people business. You want to attract talent. And the best way to do that, actually, is a fantastic headquarters building, somewhere you, where actually you've got training facilities, entertaining facilities, and so on. And the reality is those buildings are not in um, decent supply. So actually, there's a lack of um, accommodation available. If you're looking to move in London right now, just to give you an example, we've got 80 mandates right now in London, over 50,000 square, square feet. You're talking about a two, three, four year wait to actually move into your new premises. You can't get the quality of stock right now. So it's the markets, I think, separate into two. Best in class is doing really well, but the weaker um, um, sector is, is struggling. A lot more insights to dive into. That's all we have time for for right now. Liam Bailey, Knight Frank, Global Head of Research. Thanks so much for taking the time here. Thank you. Absolutely. Everyone, let's do a quick final check of the markets. As of right now, we've got all major U.S. averages in positive territory. The Dow up by about six tenths of a percent. Fractional gains for the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, four tenths of a percent for both of those roughly. And as we're taking a look as well across the board here, a ton of earnings that we're going to be slated for later on today. However, that's it for right now in this 11 to 12 a.m. hour. Well, you've been watching, tuning into Yahoo Finance. I'm Brad Smith. Thanks so much. We'll see you tomorrow.